and watercraft. Um, because of the shape of the lot, and th although the dock's in the middle of the property, um, depending on the size of the boat being parked alongside the dock, there could still be encroachment. And so it is unknown, but it could possibly be injurious to the area. We do find, however, it meets criteria one, two, and three. It is a wed wedge-shaped parcel. And although the dock can meet setbacks at the waterfront line, due to the convergence of the property lines, it restricts the available area for the dock to um, not be able to encroach into the setbacks. And that's not a result of the actions of the ac applicant. Um, and then literal interpretation of the code may cause an unnecessary hardship. The width of the waterfront property line combined with the angle of the side property lines would severely restrict the size and length of a dock to a point that it may not serve its intended purpose. We have provided three conditions for your consideration should this board find that the applicant has provided competent and substantial evidence. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Any questions for staff? Mr. Bender? I'm looking at the overhead that we have and do we know if there's a homeowner association that might have some kind of covenant that says you can't have a, uh, a pier dock because it appears that all of the docks in there uh, are this uh, platform type. Do we have any clue of that? No, we do, do not. Okay. Okay, any other questions for staff? Okay. Is the applicant present? Can I get you to come forward, please? And if I could get you to state your name and address for the record. My name is Kim Leggett. Uh, talk into the mic, please. Kim Leggett, 22 Village Drive. Okay. Uh, you've heard the staff report. Uh, anything you'd like to add to that? Um, no, just um, being with the agent with the dock builder for the project and um, the way that the property line goes as far as buying waterfront property. This is the only way they'd be able to get a boat in that would not affect either one of their neighbors as far as pulling a boat in. Okay. So that's why we've proposed and done the smallest dock possible that would fit the needs of the homeowner and yet not affect the adjoining property. All right. Do we have any questions for the applicant? Mr. Feller? Um, and I don't know if you'll be able to answer this because I know you're the, doc, you're the dock builder, correct? Not the homeowner. Is the homeowner here today by chance? No, they're not. No. They couldn't okay. make it. Um, it follows up on what Mr. Bender said. All of these um, docks look like they're all attached to the seawall, smaller. Yeah. Did you have to go through anything with uh, HOA, or did they have any restrictions or covenants? There is no at the HOA. So there's no HOA mm -hmm. that would prevent this. I see that we have a letter of support. Is that, f do you know? That was from um, one of the homeowners, and the other one was supposed to be sending something in, they said. Because um, the way the dock is now, if they were to um, add a boat lift there, the way the homeowner would have to pull his boat in could possibly <laughs> affect the adjoining. This is why we'd want the dock to be straight in, so they could just pull their boat straight in and pull it straight back out. All righty. And my only other question, and I'm sorry, you may not know the answer to this. <laughs> We've run into this before where Volusia County's lot lines, because this is a, a shaped lot, converge, like they said. Mm -hmm. But with waterfront lots, there's always been some determination about waterways where it goes you know, per out to the, to the mean water area. I see this as kind of like a back canal. It is. It's so not, you know, you know it's not navigational waterways. It's, it's just a man-made private. So um, there's really not that many rules technically on it. Right. And so you're saying this is the smallest configuration that could allow for that. Okay. To that's allow for what the homeowner would like it to do. And yeah, that's an odd shape lot. <laughs> it <laughs> is you. very odd shape. And I feel bad that <laughs> they didn't realize this prior to buying. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions for the applicant? Mr. Yeah, Bennett? I do. Does the owner have any problems with the uh, three stipulations from staff? No. Okay. Mr. Bender, you have a question? Uh, this may be for staff. I'm looking at uh, from land development where they're saying that the parcel has uh, is not vested. What do they need to do to, to be vested? And then how does that affect our decision? It doesn't affect your decision. That is just a formality that they have to go through a vested rights determination. Um, it, we're now including the land development memorandums in the agenda packet. Otherwise, they, and that's to ensure that the applicant gets them. Um, 
but it's, it really doesn't bear on your decision with regard to the variance at all. Okay, any other questions for the applicant? All right, you may be seated. We'll see if we have anybody that wants to speak to this case. Is there, Ms. Flowers, do we have anybody on the web that would like to speak to this case? Yes, sir. Um, we have Shonda Kennedy. Okay. You get them on, please. Ms. Kennedy, unmute your mic. Yes, ma'am. This is Shonda Kennedy at 1016 Shockney Drive. Yes, Ms. Kennedy, you had some comments that you'd like to make to this case? Yes, sir. Um, my biggest question is with custom built docks and this lot, um, you guys are correct. All the docks are built along the seawalls because we all pull in with our vessels at a roundabout there. And if this dock goes in, I will have to crab walk my vessel out from my dock in order to get in and out of my dock. Then the plans that are drawn up from custom docks that was sent to me for, to sign that variance letter also shows an 8,000 pound lift to go on the east side of that dock. That, and in section three from the owners, they did indicate that that lift would be in with the dock. But when you see the drawings that was submitted, the lift was not included. So my question is also, are they intending on putting in a lift on the east side of that dock, which would definitely come over and encroach upon not only the, the lines, but encroach upon my property? Okay, I'll try. So to I'm against it. Pretty <clears throat> long story. Yeah, I'm, I'm not for this at all. Okay, I'll try to get you some answers on that and okay. get some clarification. Thank you for your participation. Do we have anyone else? We have a Mr. Harris online. He does not wish to speak. Okay. Do we have anybody in the audience like to speak to this case? Okay. Could I get you to come back and answer that question for me, please? Uh, yes, we did submit a this, the dock with the four post lift for, so for the cradle lift so they can park their boat. Okay, so it is going to have a lift on the east side. Yes. Is that in our packet, Ms. Jackson? Um, I have to look, but with the problem is that we don't, well, it's not a problem, but it, we don't regulate the boat lift. We only regulate the boat dock. So they can put in a boat lift and it doesn't have to meet the same setbacks that the dock does. Can we put a condition on it, Mr. Soria? Yes, and you can, uh, depending on what that condition is, you can, um, <laughs> well, it's essentially you'd restrict the dock as, as provided with no additional um, encroachments you know, into the already reduced setbacks. Um, uh, it may force a redesign, so I don't know if the applicant would want to come back because if that, if, if the lift is necessary for the operation of the dock, um, you know, they may actually want a redesign instead of having to work around that, that condition and stipulation. But we could place the variances conditional upon that it, everything meets within the area that has been requested? Right. Yes, essentially, you you would you would say no uh, no other encroachments um, that are connected to the dock. I mean, the, uh, it just doesn't contemplate the boat. The boat can so, can be within the setback, but anything attached to the dock, you can you have control over. Okay. Can I ask a question, Mr. Here? Feller? So can you hold that picture up again that you did because it's very. Are, are you We're putting it on the okay. overhead. Could she put that on the screen? Because that. Trying. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Because that definitely makes it. Yeah. So we those those pylons. This is for staff. Those pylons that go further to the east, they're not required to have. They're not required to be within the setbacks. No, we don't govern the those pylons or boat lifts. We only govern the placement of the dock itself. Understood. Just a fixed structure. It, even if it's attached to the dock. 
Sie, yes, sir. Because I assume, I'm sorry, did that take you to go from the back? No. There, will there be a roof connecting? It's so just, it's just going to be freestanding pylons? There'll be a cradle lift, and that's where they can pull their buildings up. And then the only other thing I have is I have one question for the person who voiced opposition, if she's still on the line and she can answer. Is that possible? Can we get her back on, Ms. Flowers, if she's uh, still there? Because I guess she can come in and not work, but no. Yes, sir, I'm here. Um, Go ahead, ahead, Mr. Peller. Thank you, Chair. My question to you would be, if the boat lift were not on the east side, but were on the waterway side, so facing out, away, and, the, and they were pulling into that way, would that impede the flow any different? Are you... Um, because you're saying that the boat dock will impede further past this dock, but if it were on, if the lift were on the, I don't know what that would be, the south side or the side closest to the open water, would that in, in, inflict? Would that be a conflict with your dock? If it was on the west side versus the east side, it should not conflict with my dock. But what it's going to do is conflict with the other dock that's going parallel to right. the seawall um, they've got a lift and a dock on the east side of them too, two lots over. It might impede them, but it would not impede me if they put it on the east side or the west side versus the east side. Right. I was thinking more of the south side, I guess, is what it would the be. The south side. Point. Then that's my side, I think, isn't it? Well, I'm, I don't know. That's what I'm trying to figure where's, out. <laughs> where is her lawn? Yeah, yeah, I'm... The way the boat dock uh, be positioned it so it wouldn't affect anybody. So they would just pull in and pull out. But it does encroach past the eight foot variance that we are looking at here if that boat were there, which I understand is not the issue of it, but those pylons and everything. But that's, I guess that's to be taken into consideration. Because if they stick okay. with a marginal Thank dock you. that they have now and put a lift coming, like you say, out to the south side of it, then them pulling into their lift would encroach on both parties, no matter how they pull in. Okay. That's I why we decided to go yep. straight in to make it easier. I mean, we can always shorten the platform so it's not a 10 foot wide platform and narrow that down a little bit to help with making it fit. I, you, I guess the only thing I'm saying is, is the platform meaning the, the walk out to the dock or the, the dock walk itself? out has to be a four foot walk okay. that's towed, yeah. but the platform at the end, which was a 10 by, oh, I should take it now. Um, is it 10 by six, I believe okay. it was, or 10 by eight. Okay. 10 by 10. <laughs> yeah, okay. that down Thank you. 10 by 8. Thank you, Mr. Peller. Okay, do you have any other questions for the speaker, Mr. Peller? No, okay. Thank you, Ms. Kennedy, again. You're welcome. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, you've answered your question. Thank you. Oh, you made it. Okay. We don't have anyone else who want to speak here. I'm going to close the floor for uh, public participation and open up for commission discussion or a motion. <clears throat> I'm having a difficult time understanding why they can't make that size of a dock parallel to the property. Because it looks like the wood deck that's there now is a lot narrower than what the deck would be on the uh, extended dock. So then they could put their lift right beside it. You follow where I'm going with this? Mm -hmm. Because the, the size of the dock that is there, I know it's pretty close to the property line, but according to this layout that we get on the site plan, that platform is narrower than what that existing wood deck is. So why couldn't they just put their lift right beside it? I, I don't I don't understand the reasoning for extending it out. And Mr. Chair, you can uh, you can have the applicant come back and, you know, kind of go towards that. I believe she uh, she previously answered um, putting the dock putting the boat lift on the existing dock. Um, I think there were some issues with the potential conflict, but that's something for the applicant to answer. Okay. Does anybody else have that concern? Do I need to get it back up here? 
No, I, I, feel, I feel like I have the same concern as you. I feel like we're building the dock based on the specifications, but taking into account the boat lift basically doubles the size of it. Right. <laughs> and, and that's, uh, I mean, I understand that that's a technicality of sorts that we don't monitor that, but I mean, it's still space that Okay, I'm gonna get the applicant back up for a moment because I think we need some clarification on this. <clears throat> My question was the existing wood depth there that you have, you're basing, you say you need to extend it out in order so you wouldn't be encroaching upon the adjacent property owners. Is that correct? Yes. But the size of that platform on the extended deck seems to be smaller than the existing wood depth. So in saying that and taking that in consideration, why couldn't you put that deck adjacent and then go ahead and put your lift on the other side and it would make the same width and not extend it out? Are you talking about leaving the marginal dock that's there now? No. Okay. I'm talking about going ahead and building your new dock. Okay. But, but the footprint of what I'm looking at here is narrower than what the existing wood deck is. So rather than put a dead in the middle, move it over to the side and put your boat lift beside it. It looks to me like that would be the width and it wouldn't have to be extended out for variance. Um, two, I guess it is. Um, Mr. Chair, if I can understand, um, is your request just to shift the dock westward if assuming that the boat lift is going to be on the east side of the dock, essentially you would, you know, uh, they can... That's correct. Right. Uh, essentially what you would be doing is you would be um, requiring a greater variance than eight feet on the east side. Um, you can leave the west side uh, variance, um, but uh, cause a shorter platform and to move the uh, the walkway, I guess westward, so that you uh, the applicants could construct a boat lift on the east side of the dock, but further away from from Miss Kennedy. Is that is my understanding of what you're trying to? Well, that's what I'm trying to accomplish. So the boat lift doesn't encroach and move it back towards the property. Move move the whole platform back towards the property where the wooden deck used to be. I'm assuming it'd still be in the water, correct? And then put your lift on the side. But you have to allow for the length of a boat coming in to park. That's why you need that 20 feet extending outward from the property. You have to be able to park the boat on the lip. But we don't have, we're, we could give you the variance and you could still put your boat lift there. Because if we didn't put a uh, condition on the, on the lift. Not clear. Well, the boat would stick out for past the dock, pretty much. The lift would. If um, if you can see my, I can't find my drawing tools over here. But it's if if they move this portion of the dock over, and possibly reduce the size of the platform, or or not have a platform, they could put the boat lift on this side, and um, kind of try to stay in the middle of the lot with both the dock, including the boat lift. Is that what you're trying to describe? Yes, I'm trying to move that over from the center, move it to one side to accommodate the boat lift so it wouldn't encroach upon the uh, adjacent property owner. So if it's just a pier dock that was moved over on the property to, we're gonna call this side the west side and the boat lift then would be on the east side, center that the dock and the boat lift within the extended property lines. Is if that is that kind of where you're trying that's to go with this? That's pretty much where I'm going with this. Yes. So just to be clear, so you're. So leaving the boat lift, still having the four foot walkway out, are you saying just to get rid of the 10 by 10 platform at the end? You need to get following you need through to move the that, four foot walkway? That whole thing over, the walkway too, in order to accomplish what we're talking about. And leaving the platform the 10 by 10 or no? Well, that's up to No, you. that would be removed because that would be then right uh, the pushed line. out further right. to the property line or even over the property line. So it would be removing the platform, moving the 
the walkway over to the east. Okay. So and just having a four foot walkway going out with a boat lift is with what you're the boat proposing. lift. And both of those together need to be centered in the middle of the lot. Okay. That's what I'm looking at. Okay, so four foot walkway extending mm -hmm. out, which would go out. I mean, that, that's just me feet. now. Well, the other okay. well, I'm just members trying to have to so agree to it also, but, but if we were to take that off and move that over and then get your lift on that side, it wouldn't encroach upon anyone there. Okay, so it would be a 20 foot walkway, four foot wide with the boat lift, the four pole boat lift. Yes. Is that what we're looking at? Is that what you had in mind, Ms. Jackson? Well, that's what I'm trying to work out what you're trying to say <laughs> and see what would work for that both the applicant as well as protect the other docks adjacent to it because they do have to come in to their docks that are along the seawall. And so having this dock extending out, I, I understand that they have problems getting to their dock because of the bend. They're at mm -hmm. absolute corner of this canal. Um, so this would help them, but it would also, it, I think that it would protect the other adjacent docks ability to get to their boats and, and leave from their docks. And they would still be able to access their, the lift and the, their boat alongside the, I think that's the what, the east side? We're yeah. calling this side the east side and mm -hmm. this side the west side. Right. So if they were to move the walkway over. Move this over to like over there. here. Yeah. And then the put the boat there, lift right here. And you wouldn't be encroaching on anyone. Right. They still need variances though because of the convergence mm -hmm. of the property lines. But, but they'd be less. Mr. Feller? Yeah, and that's what I was going to say. They would be less, but also... I think the hard part that I'm trying to take in here is, um, is that that boat lift part of it isn't considered part of it unless we make it part of it. And I think that that's based on the call of the, of the, per the opposition, the neighbor that says that they would have to crab walk in. I think we should take that into account that getting into there, I understand it's hard. It's a very odd shaped lot and I get it, but I think that we have to make this the absolute smallest footprint not just for the dock that we see, but for that boat lift too, I agree. Well, according to our variances, Ms. Sasori, you can tell me if I'm correct. According to our variances, we could go ahead and give them the variances, but the boat lift would have to be within those variances. Yes, you can condition on, you can, you can condition that, that the, the variance um, request would include any um, other structures such as a boat lift, and that must be within you know, the, the variance yes, request within the support. So basically the only way for them to be able to do that would be to reduce the platform. Do you understand where we're going with this? Yes. In other words, the boat lift would have to be within the variance request also. For, for the record, I disagree with this whole conversation, just so everybody's aware. Okay. Now, um, in the, we usually we attach the site plan to your rendition letter However, you know, the site plan is, it's looking like your, the site plan is not going to be consistent with the discussion and the conditions. So um, to the greatest extent possible, kind of describe the extent of the variance request. I'm not sure if it's appropriate to, to do it at this point because we don't know the distance from the extension of the property lines for a f the four-foot walkway when you center it. Um, and also <laughs> to include the um, the boat lift. Okay. Essentially. Well, this is just in the discussion stage. Mr. Costa, you'd like to comment on it? I'm just saying that we're now regulating items that are not within our purview by adding it as a condition, period. I mean, this is about the uh, variance for the dock itself. The fact that there's a boat lift is really, not to say I want to put blinders on, but it's really outside the scope of what we're looking at here. And I think that by putting conditions on this, we're setting a precedence that we're adding now an extra layer of government self-imposed from our, from where we sit. Okay. And I understand protecting the neighbor's rights and all, but at the same time, I'm also not for additional regulation. Yeah. <coughs> Any other comment, Mr. Young? I just think that I've got to think, take it, I 
disagree with our fellow. I think that we need to take in the rights and the need of the neighbors as well. And if this lift, does, even though we're not controlling it, if it if it interferes because of the new dock interferes with the other neighbors, I have to consider it. So I have to say, uh, I take into consideration that the lift, even though we don't have the regulatory to maybe which I don't understand why not. It's a building or a build on item, but it's part of the dock in, in that it wouldn't be needed if it wasn't the docks being changed. So I'd take it into consideration. That's uh, just my comment. And Mr. Chair, if I could kind of explain. Remember the normal rule is that your dock and any of the platforms need to be 15 feet away from the extension of the property lines. So that's why we don't take into account the boat lifts because they're supposed to be 15 feet from the dock to the extension of the property lines, and that accommodates, you know, a, a boat and a boat lift. So that is your normal rule, um, and you are, you have an applicant who is seeking a, a variance to that normal rule because of a hardship, and there are certain things that would, you know, that would normally be allowed in a typical water waterfront yard that you can take into account when you are determining whether or not to grant this particular variance. And we're reducing that uh, 15 feet to 8 feet. So right. one of the ways to look at it, what, why we don't regulate the boat lift itself is because you can, you can park a boat there without a boat lift and the boat can be whatever width the boat is. So that's one of the reasons those don't get regulated because the boat's going to be there causing that further encroachment or taking up that space anyway. So we could deny variance, variance two altogether and not even regulate the boat lift <coughs> because that would take care of it. But then wouldn't the east, I'm sorry, Ken, but wouldn't the east side then have to be shrunk from back to 15 foot instead of eight foot, correct? No, you could give variance one. Right, variance one would exist, but in the drawing that we have, variance two would be at eight foot. If we didn't approve that, that has to be at 15 foot, correct? Yes, yeah, so you would have a dock that could go up to eight feet on the western side, but must meet 15 feet on the eastern side. And that 15 feet, if you don't grant variance two, can, uh, you and they'd know. have to redesign the, the walkway in the- Yeah, they'd have to move the, the walkway essentially yeah. to Just the west. Simply denying variance too. And Ms. Jackson, the only thing I'll say is, I understand what you're saying where the boat could be there, but we're actually now adding pylons. And we won't put a condition on the boat lift. Okay, okay perfect. So it, uh, you know, if, if you're concerned about the eastern side, as uh, uh, I think Mr. Feller or Mr. Uh, Chair Mills has stated, you can just deny variance too, force the dock to comply with 15 feet on the eastern side, but grant a, a variance to be eight feet on the western side, assume that they're going to park the boat on the eastern side with the boat dock and they'd have to meet 15 feet. Well, I would hope so. Yeah. <coughs> so that would give, how wide is the, pl uh, the walkway? For three foot or four foot? Four foot. Oh, four foot. So we need to give them the four foot on that. So we may have to change that variance too. Well, um, we, you don't regulate the, uh, the, I mean, it's four foot minimum requirement. I, get, I, I don't know why you would build a wider walkway unless you know you, you wanted to, but essentially you're just dealing with the how far can they be from the side. So whatever they build needs to comply. If they can build a four foot walkway or a five foot walkway, they still, the entire structure still needs to be um, uh, eight feet from the west and 15 feet from the east. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna rephrase what I was commenting on. I'm, my, my thought is to deny variance two, give them variance one, and uh, not regulate the uh, boat lift. I can support that. That's my thought. Make a motion. <laughs> Anybody have any other comments on it? Mr. Bender? Just a clarification, if uh, they get shot down here, they got to wait a year to come back, is that right? Yes, I believe so. 
see to that, or you can withdraw and regroup and then come back to us rather than waiting the whole year out. So what are we proposing at this stage? <coughs> Well, we don't no one's a, proposed anything yet. Yeah, and proposed what we're anything. talking about was denying variance two, which would move it back to the 15 feet on that, that one side. We wouldn't put a condition on the boat lift so you could put it on that side, even with the 15 foot setback for the walkway. It's pretty much what you're going to have there. And then we could give you variance, this is a my thought, give you variance one so you could accommodate that, so you could extend it out there. Okay. Okay. So you would have a walkway coming out. Mm -hmm. The walkway would be more consistent with the west side there than the east side. <coughs> and then what you would have is a, um, you, then you would have room to put your boat lift on the east side. But no platform because the they don't have the vector. No yeah. You eliminate the platform. You just have a catwalk out to your right. boat lift. Uh -huh. or just That's why I said yeah. you may want to withdraw and regroup and come back to us. Right. Just. Mm -hmm. Susan, um, just a quick question. If they keep the eight foot on the west and have a four foot dock, can they still meet 15 feet on the east? That was the point I was, I was trying to do the math right. tonight. Considering it was 11 foot. That platform is 10 feet at the, at the end. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's, it'd be taking off six feet basically. Almost seven, yeah. That, that was of what I was trying to figure out. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure that they could meet that. We wouldn't right. even need it. So, so you would, foot. they would need a, at least if you, if to meet the minimum four foot walkway, at least some sort of variance on the east side mm -hmm. um, as well. Um, at this point, I, you know, it's, it's kind of messy to start yeah. drawing things. I would recommend a continuance to the, the next day, if that is okay with the applicant, to the mm -hmm. next month. Um, so that you the property can owner and get uh, all this ironed out. Be due to the lead time for staff reports, it would probably have to go to April. Okay. Would you want to do that? Yes, please. You understand the concerns that we have, leaving the way it is and putting a boat lift on that side. Mm -hmm. Okay. So basically, we're just going to have to keep the 15 foot setbacks on the. Well, we're not sure that so you we're can. Not sure so you'd have to reduce the east yeah. variance to you know whatever you can accommodate. We don't want to grant a variance and then have it be impossible for you to actually construct what they. Right. They can build it shorter though, and it not reach all the way out as far as they've got it, and they can meet it. <coughs> but you also have to understand with pulling a boat in on a cradle slip, you have to have so much footage, or else the front of the boat would be over this like the seawall. Mm -hmm. So you have to be able to. Right, we so we I, think it, I think we need to redraw the plan mm -hmm. and to see what fits and what works for the applicant. Okay. So um, it's probably best if you continue this case. Okay. Friendly suggestion. It would, it would never hurt to um, converse with the neighbor yeah. and see if you can come to a meeting of the minds. And if you don't, you can always bring it to us that, hey, we tried to work something out and they were, you know, reasonable or unreasonable and okay. we can always take that into account as well. Yeah, so okay. I'll have Mr. Harris talk to his neighbor that is non-compliant, <coughs> so and we'll just go from there. Okay. I'll, 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 and I'll weigh in on that as well. Um, the biggest thing that I'm wrestling with is I understand that this is a hard thing for your uh, client, you know, but what I'm not willing to do is to relieve your client and create a situation for the neighbor. So everybody's got to either be, you know, looked after. So that's that's where I'm kind of hard having a hard time supporting this. Okay. So we just need to redraw something up, come back and that's not going to make a hardship neighbor. for your neighbor as well. Okay. Take into consideration the boat lift pretty much. Okay. Right. <coughs> and um, and right. like Susan, what's the April meeting? That would be April 21st. Okay. Okay, so if you can make a motion to continue this item to a date certain of April 21st, we can save the applicant some, uh, some notice and advertising fees. I'll make a motion that we, <coughs> we gave, uh, give him a, a variance, or I mean give him a continuance to April 21st, is that? Yes. Yeah. That's. <coughs> you have a second? I got a motion for Mr. Young to continue this case V22034 to their April 21st meeting 2022 and a second from Mr. Sixma. Any discussion on the motion? 
All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Ms. Shelley, could I get the next case read into the record, please? V-22-043, variances to the minimum, <coughs> excuse me, variances to the minimum yard requirements on urban single family residential R9 zone property. Thank you, Ms. Shelley. Ms. Jackson, this is uh, yours also. Mr. Mr. Chair, before we begin, um, I just have a, a few words regarding this application. Um, we have the applicant who um, you know, has requested a recusal of one of your PLDRC members. Okay. Um, I have spoken with Mr. Feller. Um, so a, a the, the rule is unless you have a voting conflict, you must vote. That's, that's Florida statute. Um, a voting conflict is pursuant to uh, section 112.3143, um, and it applies if any one of you um, your relative, your business associate, uh, your, or your principal has a special private gain or loss regarding the application. So that's, that's kind of a special term of art. Uh, a special private gain or loss um, essentially means that um, an economic benefit or harm that would inure to you or some of those identified individuals as a result of the decision. So I have spoken with Mr. Feller uh, Mr. Feller does not live in the neighborhood any longer. I, I believe he used to live in the neighborhood. Um, uh, his, none of his relatives, um, as defined, would benefit from this decision. He has a real estate license, um, and I believe he, he can confirm that um, his, his broker does not have any interest on the property or any of the surrounding properties. Um, so at this point, um, uh, based on my conversations and my knowledge, there is not a voting conflict in that there is no economic benefit or harm um, that would inure to Mr. Feller or to uh, business associates, his principals, or anything like that. Now, you know, uh, you've been at this for a while, and as every single meeting, this is a quasi-judicial hearing, and um, your decisions must be based on competent, substantial evidence on the record. You're, you're acting like a judge. Um, so, Mr. Feller, you know, is, you know, can you look at this case, look at the evidence, and, and determine, uh, you know, whether or not they meet the criteria and render a, uh, an impartial uh, and fair decision? Uh, I absolutely can, yes. And I do have a letter from my broker. I'll read it in the record. February 16, 2022, to whom it may concern. Century 21 Alton Clark has no active listings in Bethune Beach at this time, nor any ownership interest in real estate in Bethune Beach. If there are any questions surrounding this matter, please contact me directly. Regards, James Clark, Broker Century 21, Alton Clark. And I can put it into the record. Okay. So Thank we got you. that settled. Uh, so Mr. Feller will not be recusing himself this morning. Okay, Ms. Jackson, you want to read that into the record, please? I mean, uh, you want to make the staff. I'll start the staff. Boy, I'm, uh, <laughs> had a rough morning here this morning. <laughs> All right. Um, there are three variances associated with this case. Variance one is to reduce the west side yard from 25 feet to 15 feet. Variance two, to reduce the south side yard from 15 feet to 7.25 feet. And variance three, to reduce the waterfront yard from 25 feet to 7.5 feet, all for a proposed new residence. The property is located at 6887 South Atlantic Avenue in New Smyrna Beach. The property is zoned R9 and it is considered a lawful non-conforming lot. It's a beachfront lot as you can see on the aerial. And it's a corner lot. Um, it's adjacent to Atlantic Avenue to the west and Sheepshead Avenue extension to the south. The extension is not an actual developed roadway. It is a right of way and therefore requires a front yard, um, but it is a pedestrian access to the beach. Um, in the R9 zoning classification, the uh, applicable front yard setbacks require 25 feet to uh, the primary front yard and 15 feet to the uh, not primary front yard. So it would be 25 feet to Atlantic Avenue and 15 feet to the uh, Sheepshead Avenue extension. 
And then it's also a waterfront yard, and waterfront yards require a 25-foot setback measured from the landward side of the revetment. The north property line is considered a side yard and requires a seven-foot setback, and the applicant proposes to meet this side yard. Um, as I said, the property is a legal non-conforming lot uh, that measures 50 feet wide by 100 feet deep. The buildable area is, is reduced because the lot is basically 25 feet less than it uh, normally would be and 2,500 square feet less in area. So the proposed new house measures 20 or er, measures 35.66 feet wide by 48 feet deep and it exceeds the buildable area of the lot which if all setbacks were applied is approximately 28 feet by 28 feet so the applicant is requesting these variances to reduce the front yard adjacent to atlantic avenue um, to 15 feet and that uh, adjacent to Sheep's Head Avenue extension to seven and a half feet and then the waterfront yard to seven and a half feet. Tends, as I said, he intends to meet the north side yard. The house that he's proposing is approximately 4,600 square feet in buildable area and, a, and three stories in height. It, the um, plans show that it is within our um, height limitations of 35 feet with the exception of the railing that he's showing on the top um, uh, on the elevations that were provided in your packet I would like to um, put on the record though that this any variances that may be approved here do not approve a particular uh, house plan they just approve a site plan um, in review of the historic aerials, um, it shows that the previous house that was on the property appears to have been built to similar setbacks. In addition, the adjacent houses, we have looked at some of the adjacent houses, they also appear to have lesser setbacks. That doesn't necessarily mean they were permitted that way or that we have record of the permits. M many of these homes were built in the 1970s and we just don't, there is, there, we do not have site plans to be able to determine exactly what is built on the site. And I'd also like to note that there was a deck associated with the previous single family residence that's still currently on the site. And the applicant has stated that that will be removed. So when we review these variances, um, we find that we have to recommend denial as we find that they fail to meet one of the five criteria. We find that it fails to meet criteria four. It's not the minimum variance request. The house could be redesigned to um, be smaller, to meet better meet the setbacks, if not meet them completely, although we understand that it would be quite a small house on this lot. <coughs> we do find, however, that it meets criteria one, two, three, and five. It is that we find there are unique uh, circumstances associated with the lot being non-conforming, a lawful non-conforming lot. It's 2,500 square feet less in size and 25 feet left less in width than a typical R9 lot. And it's also a corner lot with two fronts and a waterfront lot. Um, so it considerably reduces the buildable area. These uh, issues are not the result of the applicant's actions Literal interpretation of the code may cause an unnecessary hardship as it would severely limit the buildable footprint of the, uh, of the lot. And the variances we find to be unlikely to be injurious to the area, um, both along Atlantic Avenue and adjacent to beach accesses, we've, we have issued similar type of variances and the resulting residents will be similar in size and character to others in the immediate area. We have provided conditions for your consideration should the applicant provide competent and substantial evidence for you to consider approval of his uh, variance request. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. I'd like a clarification here. Now, the maximum height is 35 feet, correct? That's correct. And according to this, we're, we're not approving the um, the building layout. We're just we're looking at the footprint of the building. Is that correct? That's correct. 
And my question to you is, where do you measure that 35 foot from, from the bottom? Would you, because the ground level, there's some pilings on the bottom, and normally, I'm looking at these other uh, residents in the area, and they have a parking underneath the building. That, could that be used for parking underneath? Yes, that is within the 35 feet. It's measured from average grade to the median height of the roof. So in this case, it's a flat roof. And so it's measured to the top of the flat roof from, from, median, from average grade of the lot. And how is average grade established? Where the footprint of the house is, the grade of the lot is determined and it's from that point. <coughs> okay. Mr. Bender, you had a question? I just have one, regardless what we decide here today uh, in this body, they can build a 28 by 28, three story, whatever they want to do. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Sir, I always have questions. Um, you said the 25 foot, you, you said it was a smaller lot because the 25 foot was removed. So is this a 50 by 100 lot or is it a 50 by 75? What were you saying about that? It's 50 by 100. It's, it's, a, it's a lawful non-conforming lot. Okay. It's 50 feet wide by 100 feet So the deep. setbacks are 25 foot ocean side and 25 foot front side. Is that correct? That's correct. So if the house is 48 foot, why Because can't the revetment, it, the waterfront yard is measured from the revetment, which is further into their lot. You so they own so the further further past that. It's they don't, not buildable. They, they, they don't get to build from there. The waterfront yard is measured from the revetment, which is in the middle of their yard. Okay. As if you can see over here, the yeah. revetment is right here. Right, and that's the Their rock lot thing. goes down to here. Gotcha. So I believe this lot is subject to a 25 front yard on, is that Atlantic? Atlantic, Atlantic. on this Atlantic. side. Uh, 25 front yard from Sheep's? 15. 15, 15 from Sheep's Head. Yeah, 15 from Sheep's Head, and uh, twen is it 20 or 25? 25 then from the revetment. Right. So those are the, the existing constraints of this, this property. And the, <coughs> the side line, the side that, of, that goes against the, I mean what we always call the second front yard, by default you're allowed to move that down just without like isn't that administratively allowed but we're asking to go a little bit further correct i'm not understanding you know how when we talked about two front yards we you there you said administratively we can we can shr shrink one of them we did it on on the one in bikini as well too it's not administratively it's, yeah. that's not administratively that's not administratively. something that we okay we do all righty and then the only other question i would have is this so the lot size is still 50 by 100, but they can only build to the revet, the revetment is where it's measured from. A house of this size would have drastic land coverage that they could build difference. Does that, is that taken into account or is it still based on the lot size, the 35% coverage? You know, isn't that, you can only, your house, your, your dwelling can only cover 35% of the buildable lot, correct? That's including the other 25 feet past the revetment actually a good question. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm not it, sure that I. If they can't build past the revetment, then that's just beach land. But then a 4,600 square foot would make, I mean, a huge. I mean, that would be like 50% land coverage. I believe that the that it would be from the revetment line landward, but I'm going to um, try to get clarification on that while we're. Okay. discussing this case. If, if that were the case, this would ex far exceed, just the dimensions of, of the 28 by 44 would far exceed the land coverage, in, by my calculations. So if we can get clarification on that, that would be great. Okay, any other questions for staff? Or comments? Okay. Is the applicant present? And if I could get your name and address for the record, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Good morning, uh, ladies, gentlemen, commissioners. Uh, my name is Ricky Schrader, Moose Myrtle Beach Construction Company. My address is 6381 Ingram Road, Moose Myrtle Beach, Florida, 32169. Also, I'd like to introduce the applicants, 
Dr. Okay. Dr. Dr. Just and her husband, Tyson Beckett. Okay, I need their uh, actual speak, come to the mic and tell us your name and address, please. Hi, my name is Dr. Nadia Horst. Uh, I live in Fort Lauderdale currently, and at uh, 1215 East Broward Boulevard. Okay, thank you. And you, sir? My name is Tyson Beecher. Uh, same address, the 1215 East Broward Boulevard in Fort Lauderdale, 33301. All right. That's the technicality we have to ask that. for. The, it's got to be for the record, so we'll know who we're talking to. <laughs> okay, Mr. Schrader, go ahead. And you heard the staff report. Anything you'd like to add to it? Yes. Uh, I've been a resident of uh, Bethune Beach in this area for almost 30 years. I built my home there 25 years ago and lived there at least since I built that home three and a half years. So I guess it's 28 and a half years. Uh, I've been building down there for 35 years. And uh, I know everything pretty well down here. And uh, I just want you to know uh, that w w what we're asking to be is, uh, I have two rules in life. That second one is love your neighbors, you love yourself. And, and you know, I'm a servant to my clients, but I'm also a, a servant to Volusia County and our community. And I've shown that by community action over the years, okay? Okay. Uh, the uh, home that we're proposing is, uh, is uh, similar to other homes that are up and down the ocean right there, up and down the beach. Uh, the home to the north, our home is smaller than it, not as close to the ocean, okay? And that's the same with the home to the south. Uh, there are three streets that run into the ocean that have extensions. Those are sheephead, starfish, and trout. Every one of those homes that is built uh, has the uh, seven foot or close to a seven foot setback. Now, this doesn't hurt the walkover in my mind because those extensions are 50 foot wide. And then if you've got seven foot setback on each side, we have 64 feet, okay? And the widest on a residential uh, by the state that we can build a dune wall is four foot. So you've got 30 foot on each side of that dune walk over. But what we're asking for is common. The front yard setback that we're looking for, we chose 15 feet, but the homes to the north and the south, uh, they're right at, one, one, one of them's less than 15, one maybe a little more, okay? Uh, but they're right at the 15 feet, the homes to the north and south. The widths of them homes to the south are around 35 feet which is about what we're asking for because uh, your lots aren't normally perfectly rectangular. So the front yard, the side yard back setbacks are seven and seven. We usually go, have to go a little bit more because the lots aren't a, a perfect rectangle, okay? Something was brought up, the percentage of the lot. Uh, in the past, and again, I've been building homes on the beach for 40 years. Our parent company, Daytona Beach Construction, since 1950, all right? And I st we started this business in 1986. But you normally go the 35% percentage from the 50 by 100, okay? That smaller line, that shorter distance is called a witness line. And the reason the surveyors put that in is because it, they just can't go out in the beach and put rods, you know, where your property ends. So that's called a, a witness line, okay? And, uh, and uh, I, I feel what we're offering, uh, w w we build homes to last centuries, not decades, okay? And right now there is a, a uh, wood deck that goes all the way back to the revetment part where the revetment, so do the neighbors. The one neighbor to the south, there's a tiki hut, two-story tiki hut out into the beach, okay? And what we're trying to do is to stop back seven and a half feet from that revetment, and our porches are gonna be eight foot, but they're gonna be concrete, and they're gonna be on pilings, and they'll be there till the second coming of Christ, all right? So if there's a storm or anything, you know it's not gonna destroy them. Now, the only thing we're gonna have east of that towards the ocean is a dune walkover, which cannot be more than four foot wide, and we actually build those out of marine grade wood, stainless steel to last, and we actually, the steps, we don't stop them at the beach. We, we di dig a hole and put them down into the beach so when we have a hurricane and it washes away, uh, you don't have to go down there and get permits to add more steps. And I see that Volusia County's doing that now. But everything we've asked for, we feel uh, equals or is less 
than neighboring properties. We, we don't want to build docks over the revetment and, and do all that. And we want it to last. We want it to last. Now, you were mentioning the uh, railing up on the flat roof. Uh, we do that uh, a lot in the city of New Smyrna Beach. And you're allowed a railing up there, just like you're allowed a chimney or, or a cupola. You know, it's, it's kind of an accessory, that railing is. Now the county, I'm not sure about that. And of course, we go by the code. We'd ask for a variance if it isn't there. And, and if we get it, fine. If we don't, we, we just have to go without it. It's just nice on those flat roof, concrete roofs. We build, like I said, it'll be the second time under Christ if it's ever destroyed, you know, with a concrete roof and, you know, con all concrete and on pilings and, and uh, that sort of thing. But, but the railing thing, that's just something, you know, basically what we're looking now is, a, is, is our buildable footprint it's so that we know what we can draw, what we can design, okay? Mm -hmm. But we haven't tried to take advantage of anything. I mean, if you look at the neighboring properties, we're, we're not going out over the rocks. We're not even going up to the rocks, okay? And uh, do you have anything to add, Nadia or Tyson? Oh. Well, we, we, we just found a builder that builds in the community for a long time, and mm -hmm. we wanted somebody that's already built on that kind of a harsh environment, and that's why we called up Ricky, and we've been guided by his knowledge, but we, that's. Okay. Uh, Mr. Schrader, yes, sir. let me clarify something. I know New Smyrna may allow railings on the top, but and, but you we it would require a variance to okay. go higher than thirty five feet. I, I didn't know that. Okay. okay. The county is not going to allow you to put the railing up there if it extends higher than thirty five feet. Okay. We just recently started the concrete roof homes, and we haven't done one in the county. Okay. The, the city of New Smyrna Beach is doing one right now. Right. But uh, on the, I, I understand. You would have to have a variance to go higher than 35 feet okay. on top of the, the building. Okay? That is secondary now. Uh, the main thing is finding a, 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 an acceptable uh, building footprint. The other thing, too, is you know, if you've lived there long enough, that our dunes are being removed yearly. Uh, the, um, what I'm concerned about is on the w the water side, variance too, is that once we get a hurricane, like you said, and it washes away, and then we also get a northeasterns that come in and washes the beach away, and then we allow these homes to be built that close, and then what happens is they expect the county to come in and restore the beach area that was washed away. So we have to take that in consideration too, even though some of these homes have been built back in the 60s. Okay. But I guarantee you back in the 60s they had more beach area than they do now. They did. Okay. And we've seen that, that be, may be why that two-story two uh, tiki hut is out in the ocean next door, and the decks next door are, are beyond what we plan on doing. But I want you to understand, uh, I'm, we're working with Robert Bullard a little bit now about a staging area where they're doing revetments. Now we're the only plan for that, okay, revet the, to bring in the stone and so forth. Uh, we're working on Van Cleek uh, with the state on putting in uh, seawalls in that three properties, okay, that meet that criteria. But the homes that we build on pilings, a, 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 a piling is like a, a concrete telephone pole with steel in it, solid concrete, we put those 35 feet in the ground, three and a half stories. On top of that goes a grade beam, which is normally, say, 18 inches wide, 24 inches tall. And that sand can all wash out, and that building's still gonna be there. You might need an extension ladder to get in your garage, but that King Kong, some of them we build that are solid concrete, King Kong could pick them up and shake them and put them back down. If he's got a level, you're gonna have some cleaning up to do and all, but that's, that's how they're built. But understand, you can look up in, on your monitor, look up and down that beach right now, and when the, if there's a big one, and it's coming, they come always sooner or later, it's gonna take away a lot of that. But the homes we build, 
But you don't want cleaning. your local governments to restore your beaches. That's the problem that I have. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, but that but they're going to be restoring everybody up and down the beach. Well, I get, I understand that. But <laughs> okay. Do we have any other comments or questions for the applicant, Mr. Uh, Chair? I want to, uh, if I could, break in here. I want to uh, explain that about the lot coverage question that you had. So it is from the revetment line landward. And I just had Michael run and do the quick calculation, and it appears that the foot buildable footprint that's being requested does exceed the 35% lot coverage. It appears to be 43%. Um, if and then if we cal calculate the deck as well, that would be 48.66. That variance is not being requested, so we can't approve the footprint being requested without including that as a variance and that has not been part of the advertisement for this case. So with that, it, if um, it might be best to continue this case to a future meeting to include that variance or the variances could be considered subject to the final product meeting the lot coverage. Can you understand what has just been yes. said, Mr. Trader? Yes. Now, I've built homes up and down that beach before. Yeah. But well, this is not is something that. Bigger. This has never been brought up. Yeah. Okay. And Chair, may I? We have uh, Mr. Feller. Uh, th and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to bring it up because I think it was just two meetings ago there was an error on a house that we had to approve a 40 something percent overage because it was just missed from planning and zoning. And I think that that's why I brought it up is I didn't want it to be missed to then have to come back and do an after the fact variance to okay. do it. Okay. I, I request <coughs> that we could move forward with our variance and part of the conditions would be that there needs to be a variance for the, per the lot percentage, okay? Um, well, we can't approve that because it hasn't been advertised. Yeah. Okay. No, 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 no. We can't approve that a variance be today because for height or lot coverage because of the um, because it hasn't been advertised. Oh, oh, I so understand. now if you want to move forward with the requested variances that you have requested and meet the lot coverage, which you're not going to be able to do right. um, with, the, with the size that you've got, I mean, we can we consider it. Yes, that's what I'm asking is consideration. Because again, we all the homes up and down through there. I mean, when I say all, there's the, there's the little A-frames. But we can't there. approve lot coverage or height at this time. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Oh, I understand. So we- Fine with the height and on- Well, um, and uh, in I'm saying that- uh, we're We'll not take the railing off. Well- That's not a biggie for us. Well, what I'm saying is, is that we have to turn down the variance. We, well, we'd have to deny the variance based on the lot coverage. Yes. Yes. You're not asking for a lot coverage, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, so, the request is is setbacks. So, you know, and and as Susan said, we don't currently the design of the house is not before you. So, yeah, uh, if you approve both all all three variances, uh, they would by necessity have to design a smaller house, but they can go up to the setbacks, so they can have like a I don't know like a, a an open center area or have a house that's not perfectly square. So they, they operate independently. Um, the issue is if you grant that um, and they come in for a lot coverage, um, you've already granted you know, uh, variances for the, uh, uh, the setbacks. So uh, essentially you'd have to they'd have to independently come back with additional information of what makes this lot unique such that you know they uh, they would they, they require a greater lot coverage like what type of house um, could would they be restricted to with a you know a 35 percent lot coverage based on the uh, revetment landward and that's, okay. that's kind of not before you all right mr. young all right if we went with it today, they'd have to come back for another variance. But if we gave them a continuance, would it change it if they added that con that condition? They would have to advertise the separate variance because we, we, we want to make sure that 
what is before this board and what they're deciding has been properly advertised so that you know people in the neighborhood and the surrounding community would know the, the topics for discussion. So they'd have to pay for another variance in effect? Yes, they, they can amend uh, the existing variance. That's what I'm asking. Um, if they amend it then the, and republish it, they wouldn't have to ask for another variance. They still have to pay for the notice, but Susan, I don't know if they can amend this request that the lot coverage onto the existing variance and that's continue with the same application. That's what I'm asking. If they could amend it and then re it, follow it, then they wouldn't have to ask for another variance. Another condition, another variance. You can amend the application to include an additional variance. They will be responsible for public notice. Uh, but but they wouldn't have to pay for another variance in a oh, request. Sir, they would not. That's what I'm saying. They would not have to pay for another variance if you continued it and you amended this. That's what I was getting at. That's the advantage to, to what you're asking for, sir. Otherwise, you're going to have to pay for another variance and file it and, ha and wait for our to hear it. So that's your your decision. setback and the lot coverage. I, I, think if I think maybe we should go with a continuance, like Mr. Young was saying, we don't have to go with another one. Put it all in the same place. I agree. No, I agree. I think we should uh, uh, do a continuance and we'll add the, as Mr. Young suggested, we'll add the uh, lot coverage to the uh, criteria. Would would the next meeting the, for the continuance be April the 21st also? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. We could, uh, appreciate it. We could look at this. Let's see if we can get a continuance. Did, did you want to not include the railing on, on, on top as well and see what I, you get? I think what we'll do, uh, uh, if we agree, I'll remove the railing and, and then when we go for permitting, uh, you know, maybe, you know, you know what? I think you could, we should add, you could add that to your variance. Add that to the variance too. Yeah. Hey, and then I could do a little bit of research. Okay. Hey, there you go. I agree. Mr. Young, I, you got it. Could I you make a suggestion? Okay. I might also state uh, in considering this request, we do have uh, three emails of opposition, and we also have three people that are here today that wanted to speak to this case that was in opposition. So uh, as much as I hate to do it, if we do continue this, you know, I mean, they did take the time to come and and uh, I'd will plead stay their case. today and address it that way. If there, there's more that we need to address at the next, uh, well, we're not going to. Up to you. Of yeah, course, we're either going to continue it or we're we're not. I mean, if you don't get the decision you like, we're not going to continue it then. You know, Mr. Chair, I, I would recommend that you you know you open up the public comment, get that comment in. Um, and you know, make if if you, you want to make a motion for continuance so that Mr. Well that Schrader can come back and address on the twenty first address those concerns. Will that uh, remain on the record? Yes, their comments. So it, it's, you okay. are continuing we'll the actual that. hearing, so it's a continuation yeah, we of could, this we hearing. Could do it that okay, way. well, I'm going to let them speak today that way because they have made the trip over to to make comments on this. I agree with that. And also, um, I do want you to realize that we d are you familiar with the. These are part of the record here. You may want to look at them. We've seen them. Uh, okay, the three emails of uh, opposition. And so we're going to hear from the uh, folks that have made a, a trip over here to like to speak to this case today. Yes, sir. And then uh, you can either uh, address their concerns or wait to the next time you come. No, but we are going to hear them today, okay? So that way we know the next meeting where we're at. There's yeah. a All lot right. more involved here than what's being seen. That's All right. right. So you can have a seat, and uh, I'm going to call the people forward right now. Uh, Mr. Kevin Curtin. I could get your name and address for the record, sir. Uh, good morning, Kevin Curtin. I'm, uh, my wife and I own 6890 South Atlantic, which okay. is across the street from this. All right. The only reason I was talking about coming back is because I didn't know we could get you in on the record today. I appreciate it. Okay. I don't want you to have to make it. You can come back again if you'd <laughs> like, <laughs> and you can speak again, but, uh, but we're going to listen to what you have to say today. Okay. 
Um, again, thanks for letting me speak today. And, um, I'm opposed to the variance. I, my initial concern on hearing that a variance was being requested was that a house squeezed onto that particular lot will negatively affect my property value. Um, the variance request seeks to reduce the minimum square footage from 7,500 to 5,000, which is a 33% reduction, right? A lot doesn't even come close to being a buildable size with, with that requirement, the 7,500 square feet. Um, I also think it'd be unfair to approve this variance when adjacent pro property owners, including myself, um, conform to the existing set setbacks when improving their property. Um, reading the staff report, I, I saw that uh, it's not one but three variances, and now it looks like it's going to be five, or maybe four, um, that they're looking for, and one for each of the property lines except for the seven foot wide, the tiny little seven foot wide on the uh, north side. Um, each is a, a substantial lessening of the requirements. Um, so it's 60% on one, 48% on one, and 71% reduction on the, on the last one. Um, also, um, and, and I see that your staff recommends denying the request because it doesn't meet all the required criteria for uh, allowing variances. Um, our property across the street has been in my family since I helped my father build the house in around 1975, uh, 79. Um, I've been with family and friends there so many times over the years. Um, my wife and I acquired it um, in 2011. Um, and, and we knew that according to the current zoning regulations, a house could not be crowded on on that small lot across the street. Um, we, we both think crowding a house onto the lot next to the walkover would be a detriment to the neighborhood, to the immediate neighbors, and, and to us in particular. Um, so um, thanks again for letting me speak. All right, sir. Any, Mr. Feller? Oh, we have a question. You got a question. What's the square footage of your house? Um, 1,800. 1,800, and um, uh, that's all, thank you. Um, I, I will add that um, we are a double corner lot as well. We're on Sheepshead and South Atlantic, just like the one um, and even building it back in 79, we waived the, the requirements for setback. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Excuse me, sir. Question. Excuse me. Question. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. I, yep. Mr. Bidley, you want to say? Um, you, you do realize that they can build a house that's 28 by 28 across the street without being here. You think Absolutely. that would be better for your property value than them building a house that's a little bit larger that's... Um, I, I, I really couldn't say. Honestly, I, I, I don't know if that would be any better. Um, but, but I do know that filling up the entire available, basically the entire available space there is, is going to make it look. So I forget, a couple of years ago, um, uh, uh, emergency vehicles needed to come down. It was a, a, a pump truck and EMT truck, and they had to back down South Atlantic because they couldn't make the corner on Sheepshead. And now we're talking about putting another another property there and possibly some vehicles in front of it. And we, go, we already have a problem of people are parking on the no parking areas to start with, and the street was very, very crowded. And so I think, I think putting another property there, filling it all up, is, is certainly not going to make it look any better. Whether 28 foot wide would be better, I guess, but you know, not jammed up against the South Atlantic too. One final comment. Sorry, do you have one, Mr. Bender? Go ahead. I got a couple questions actually. You said that you, the house that you live in has been in your family since the 70s. Yep. So you've lived across the street from this particular lot. I have. When it had a, a structure on it. Yep. How long have has a structure been gone that you've had an unimpeded view of the ocean? It's about 2008. So from 08 to 22, you've had a clear shot of the ocean. Mm -hmm. And so now they're proposing to put a three-story, basically fill the entire, right. your purview of the ocean directly up in front of you. Right, would be reduced to whatever's left on the walkway. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. 
All right, that's the only question I had. Thank you. And the only other question I have is that's your walkover, correct? Is that how you get to the beach? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So that walk that walkover between the two properties yeah, is your walkover. It's 50 okay. feet from the uh, and, you, and I assume you do it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you very okay. much. Okay. Thank you, sir. All right, we have uh, Mr. Pete Vega. If I could get you to state your name and address for the record, sir. Yes, sir. Good morning. My name is Pete Vega, and I own the house at 6901 South Atlantic Avenue. The house is directly next to the lot that's here requesting a variance to the setback and the construction of this home. There is a public walkover between my house and this lot. I have several concerns and requests that you deny this variance that this builder is asking for. First, my house is 1,586 square feet. My neighbor's house to the north is approximately 2,500 square feet. And if I'm correct, this builder is asking for a house that's 4,600 square feet. That's three times the size of my house. The lot is the same size as my house, and according to the um, property appraiser, it's 50 feet wide by 75 feet deep. Now, you mentioned it was four, uh, 100 feet deep, but there is a large uh, rock base that separates the, the land from the beach itself. <coughs> Uh, the eastern portion of the waterfront and the southern portion of the waterfront is next to the walkover. Uh, Council, this builder is requesting that you greatly alter the setbacks, correct? Aren't these setbacks there for a reason? We don't want mega mansions built in a neighborhood that is surrounded by 1,500 to 2,500 square foot homes on tiny lots. We don't want uh, to be built on top of the beach and on top of the street. We do have parking issues there. There is nowhere to park on the street. Matter of fact, it's illegal to park in the street. In my particular house, somebody mentioned earlier, you actually park underneath the house because there's nowhere to park in the front, front yard of, of my house. And my house is 1,500 square feet. <clears throat> the, the county requires a 25-foot setback, Oceanside, to preserve the harmony of this waterfront. The approval of this house would damage the harmony of the neighborhood and the beach. Building monstrosities will change the neighborhood. If you approve, you will be setting a precedence which will allow neighbor, uh, homeowners in the neighborhood to knock down their homes and build virtually with no setbacks. Will these changes, change of the setbacks, will everyone enjoy the same rights? If I decide to knock my house down and make it three times the size, will I be allowed to do that? The owner of this construction company, Mr. Ricky Schrader, has been speaking out over the last 18 months requesting Volusia County to preserve our neighborhood. He complains about traffic, noise, trash, and the development of empty lots will displace rats and create a rat problem. Now he stands before you requesting to build a property for his personal benefit that will create more parking issues, trash, traffic, noise, which is exactly what he spent the last 18 months advocating against. Now there is no law for being a hypocrite. However, there is a reason there is a setback and a building code to prevent an overaggressive builder from changing the harmony of our neighborhoods. Please deny these variances and request that are before you today. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Let's see if we have any questions for you. Just a, the only thing I had to confirm is you said the house to the north was 2,500 square feet. How do you know that that I, I looked at the, on the property appraiser site. Thank you. All right. Thank you, sir. Okay. And we have a Steve Murray. Mr. Murray, if I could get your name and address for the record, sir. Good morning, Steve Murray, 6965 South Atlanta. You had comments you'd like to make about this building? Yeah, I just have some concerns. Uh, most of my concerns stem from the water side of the house and how close they're building towards the ocean. Uh, it, on how it'll affect my sight lines up and down the beach. Uh, so also the height also has an issue for me when, when he started talking about building above the 35 foot height. Uh, that and I know when even when I landscape my yard on an oceanfront property there are lots of hoops I had to jump through to have native fauna uh, so there's a lot of restrictions because of oceanfront properties and so I, I just want those same sort of strict criteria upheld when when you consider these variances all right sir I'll see if I have any questions for you I just asked the same question what's the square footage of your house you're right on South Atlantic beachside my house was built on a double lot, so okay. it's 4,000 square feet, just under 4,000. 4,000 square feet on a 100 by 100 lot. 
or 75, whatever, it's, whatever that, what that that's would that be. It's a large amount. Okay, of thank you. Okay, any other questions? Okay, thank you, sir. Okay, do we have anybody on the web that would like to speak to this case, Ms. Flack? No, sir. Okay. We've got that taken care of, and I don't think there's anybody else in here that would like to speak to this case. I hear seeing none. Um, we're going to close the floor for to public participation and consider a continuance at this time. Um, um, you want me to make a motion? Well, yes. Is it, um, unless Mr. Schrader wants to go on through with it, I mean, you want to. You can more, you're more than welcome to, sir. Can I ask one question of staff before we make a motion? Go ahead. Uh, and I'm sorry I didn't ask this when you did your presentation, staff. There were two things also. It said, and I think this is probably just administratively, the parcel is two lots and they need to be combined. I, I assume that's just. So most of the properties out there, they were actually platted at 25 feet wide. Oh, okay. And so many of them are, are just two lots and when they need to be combined when they're going to be utilized as one buildable parcel. Um, and the two lots don't meet right. minimum standards. Right. But that's been normal for us. I've seen that. That's before. very normal. And then the only other question I had was, it said the requirement of a class two ordinance to provide a volume of stormwater retention, blah, blah, blah. I don't need to say it like that, but just to keep going on, et cetera, et cetera. The plans for this variance do not provide those calculations. Therefore, it's unclear if the project can meet the class two overlay. Is that something that happens further down the road? That happens during building permit permitting stage. Okay, I'm gonna allow Mr. Schrader for his rebuttal at this time for the people who just spoke. And Mr. Schrader, go ahead. Uh, I'd like to start with, I believe, uh, Mr. Curtin, correct? Uh, you need to address us, not them. Sorry, I just wanna make sure okay. I have the right one. Okay. I'll address you, and if you have any questions, please ask me. Uh, like I say, you love your neighbors, you love yourself, and uh, just have the experience. I don't know a lot about a lot of things, but I'm normally the smartest guy in the room when it comes to drilling, humbly spoke. Only fuck that. That's all I've ever done for last long, going into the fifth decade, okay? Uh, uh, the letter that was written to you, I am writing to res respectfully request that is for parcel number be denied. As stated in the regulations, the current zoning rules are put in place to provide for continued medium density family dwellings on existing platted lots with minimum lot size of 7,500 square feet. Granting a variance for a home to be built on a lot that is approximately 2,500 square feet too small would increase the crowding issue that we already experience. The zoning regulations were put in place by the board for a reason, and that reason still exists, all right? Uh, number one, I'd like to, to say is uh, uh, the Curtin's lot across the street is 50 by 100. It's kind of silly to me that you're saying you shouldn't build on a 50 by 100 lot, and their lot is 50 by 100, okay? I'd also like to state that m I've built a lot of homes up and down that beach over the last three and a half decades. Most of the lots I build on are 50 by 100, all right? And we, and uh, uh, so that's, uh, that's a statement that I think needs checked off the list. I think you know that, you're on the board. I'm speaking to the choir, all right? And lots that adjoin public beach walkovers have a special responsibility to the public. I'm reading from the letter. Crowding a home right up next to the walkover oh. would detract from the beauty of the dune and make the experience less attractive for everyone up and down the street that utilizes that walkover. Okay. As I had mentioned before, that's a 50 foot easement. If you have a seven foot setback on each side, okay, uh, you got 64 feet you, you got a four foot walkways, the maximum we can build as per state, you have 30 feet on each side. And I'd also like to state for the record, you can look on your computer there, you go to the end of Sheephead where we're at, the end of to Starfish down the road and end of Trout, those are the three extensions on the roads. Every one of those homes is approximately seven foot off the right of way. That, that this, is, this, this would be the first one that wasn't allowed, okay? They've all been allowed. Okay. Okay, Mr. Schrader, we've got the letter in front of us. You can reference the letter, but you don't need to read it. I, for, I understand. Verbatim. Well, then, you've read the letter. <coughs> we have the thing here about the fence and that we had to abide by. Well, I've been building in Volusia County for 40 years, 37 years my own business, and I can never remember, and Susan can address this, that 
you put your fence on the prop just inside your property line. The, the only thing is when it's a front yard, it can't be more than four foot tall. And once you get into the backyard area, you can be six foot tall. So I feel that uh, this is a false statement. I would like to clarify that on waterfront yards, they're only allowed to be three feet in height. Uh, all right, but th they do not live on a rutter front, front yard. They live uh, across the street from the uh, from from our project. Okay, and, and one thing while I'm thinking, I would like to res uh, reference what Mr. Costa said. We build a lot of oceanfront homes and riverfront homes, and I can't remember one where when we went into a lot where a home had been cleared or had been virgin ground that the neighbors across the street were losing their deer and it caused anger you know and you know as well as i do if you want the view you got to be able to buy the property you know your, your view across the street mr costa knows about that i think he knows a little bit about real estate or something but but he knows exactly what i'm talking about so that addresses that one uh, the other complaint that other letter it, it really doesn't mean a whole lot. Now, something I think we need to get clear. Uh, what we got going on here today has little to do with the, with the uh, variances that we're asking for. It has to do, you might call it political, okay? I got a picture of my phone of Mr. Feller and Mr. Vega and Mr. Murray okay. yesterday at code enforcement where Mr. Fegg almost got a forty-six thousand dollars. Uh, Mr. Chair, well, we're going we to stick. We're going to yeah. We're going to stick this. Say. Keep this to the uh, request well, and, and th basically th that's the I, request. Just so if, you know, if it's not pertinent to the, the case. last thing, my recuse. If you go to my website, Google New Smyrna Beach Construction Company, Google, or House, or Facebook. Facebook, we took down. You'll see where Mr. Feller wrote in there. I now listen, wanna, that listen. we building my home, but I have a legal case against him. But I don't want to hear this. The attorney knows, Mr. Soria. We'll leave it at that, and I'll yes. stick to facts. And, and and Mr. Chair, like and any statements towards you know Mr. Schrader himself personally, you should also disregard. You you, you should just take into account the evidence presented and whether or not it meets the criteria. So any personal statements, you know. Yeah. You know, in the you, you need to disregard that. Mr. I Chair, think we, we realize that, and we don't want to get into a discussion here this morning. M and I Mr. think I've given you the proper time to for your rebuttal. M Mr. Chair, so are we no. moving on to a continuance here? No. Uh -uh. Are we moving on to a continuance? Yeah, well, I think so, yes. Sir. I would like my rebuttal up against what Mr. Vega came up here and said. Well, that's my right to review. <laughs> well, we're going to give you that right at the next meeting. We're not going to give it to you this morning because it seems like. We got some frustrations going on here, and we've got to stop it at the. We got to nip it in the bud, and that's going to be the end of it. Mm -hmm. We're going to give you your continuance. You're going to have your opportunity to come back again, All because right. you've requested. You're going to be requesting two more variances. Yes, uh, sir. From what I understand, so uh, we can we, we can make a motion for a re uh, continuance. That doesn't necessarily. I'll make that yet. motion to for continuance to the next uh, meeting, which is. March or uh, April 21st. Second. Okay. That's I the do end have of that. a motion on the floor for a continuance to April the 21st. So Mr. Uh, Schrader can consider his other two uh, variances. Mm -hmm. And a um, second from Mr. Sixma. Uh, any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. You got to continue. Got your continuous. Thank sir. you. I appreciate April twenty first. Have a good day. Ms. Shelley. Yes, sir. Case number V dash twenty two dash zero four nine. Variances to the minimum yard requirements on prime agricultural A one zoned property. Okay, thank you, Ms. Shelley. Mr. Hansen. Uh, good morning. Uh, one thing before I get really going into it, uh, just notice in my staff report here, under uh, the recommendation section for variance four and five in the table, it shows that I listed that it meets four out of the five criteria. It says that it fills 
criteria four with a recommendation of approve. That recommendation in that cell should read deny. Otherwise, the remainder of the staff report is correct. Um, moving into the, the staff report, um, for the, the Carson's uh, property over at 30, 331 North County Road 415, the parcel is a conforming 10 acre lot that is zoned A1. It has a future land use as an agricultural resource. Uh, the, the purpose for the variance in this case, the applicants are seeking to add an accessory structure for a garage purpose to be located to the east of their existing residence, south of the pond that you can see on the aerial pictometry. Um, upon review of this case, however, I found that the property is ringed with a 30-foot easement on all four sides that has the terms uh, drainage, utility, and road. Because it has the, the term road in the easement, we treat each of the borders on this property as a front yard. So because it's an A1 zone property, that makes a setback on every single side of this property 100 feet. And because of that, I had to create three variances to legitimize the existing structures on the property for the single family residence, plus two existing sheds. So variance one is the variance for the actual house that would actually make it reducing the variance from 100 feet to the 40 feet by uh, 40.82 feet. Um, variance two is talking about the uh, first or the closest shed um, to the the south setback, reducing that from 100 feet to 45.09 feet. Variance three is the shed that is located just north of the uh, the most southernmost shed, reducing the the setback from 100 feet to 67.93 feet. Uh, variance four and five are in relation to the proposed new accessory structure that the applicants are seeking to um, build. That said, it's kind of unusual that a, a parcel would be ringed with four easements that include the term road, effectively giving this, this parcel four front yards. Um, they purchased the property in December of 2018. The resi existing residence uh, was permitted for construction back in 1994. At the time, I'm working under the, the assumed knowledge that it was <laughs> permitted in error as the, uh, I went back and took a look over the actual deed and the language for uh, histor the historical significance of it is that that easement has existed essentially since the previous owner, uh, who happens to be the current applicant's father, purchased the property back in the late 80s. Um, so realistically, for the permitting of the existing structure, it probably should have never been permitted. Um, so. Variances one, two, and three are to clean up the, the error that was made and to legitimize the existing structures. Um, let's see. So because of the location of the house and the two sheds, that's why we're, I, I, I put on variance one, two, and three for this application. Variance four and five deal with the 30 foot by 60 foot um, garage or proposed accessory building that the applicants are seeking. Um, and that is currently located to be 81.22 feet from the eastern front yard setback and 64.1 feet from the southern setback, or southern front yard setback. During this time, at, 
from the initial pre-application meeting, the applicants have adjusted the location of the proposed accessory structure to bring it further into the property to try and minimize the impact on the actual setbacks that they are find themselves facing. After speaking with the applicants, none of the existing easements on this property have historically been used for the purposes of a road. On the, the southern side of the variant site plan, you can see the applicant's driveway. I've been told that the easements have only been used for utility purposes and the natural drainage of the property. With the easements ringing this property, as you can see on the variant site plan, there's a dotted line that shows inside of that is the buildable footprint. I did a measurement. Everything on the outside of that dotted line is approximately 40% of the applicant's 10 acre lot, so about approximately four acres is considered unbuildable as is. The applicant's desired location for the new proposed accessory building was strategically placed in an area east of the house and south of the existing farm pond that's on the property because that is an area on the property that is uh, the most or the, the least dense as far as covered with natural foliage. The applicants did not want to have to site the proposed accessory structure in an area more central to the actual property, which they theoretically could do without a variance application. However, doing so would require them to clear further trees, which is something that they're seeking to avoid. And that is the, the basis for the actual variance application. If uh, the 30-foot easement, including the word roads, were not there, the applicants would then be subjected, instead of four front yards, only one front yard on the west side of the property, two side yards, and one rear yard, which in an A1 zone property would be 50 feet, and a variance in this case would not be necessary any of the variances wouldn't be necessary and the applicants wouldn't be here today. Upon review of the actual case, I found that variances one, two, and three met all five criteria for approving said variances, um, noting the special circumstance in the situation that the parcels ring by that 30 foot easement, that does include the word road, subjecting the applicants to having four front yards on the property. That is not an action that was the cause of the applicants. So I found they met criteria two in that aspect. The little interpretation of the provisions of the zoning ordinance would in fact work in an unnecessary and undue hardship on the applicant because it would effectively subject them to a 130 foot uh, setback from the actual property line. And if they, if this var variance is one, two, and three were found to, uh, to be denied by this board, it could cause the applicants to have to potentially move their house further into their property along with their two existing sheds, which the house has existed in its current configuration since approximately 1994 without causing any injury to the existing neighborhood. So I felt that variances one, two, and three met all five criteria. Variances four and five, however, I felt met four of the five criteria. The one criteria that they, they fell that in, in the staff report was criteria four because they theoretically could build the proposed accessory structure more inward into their property within that buildable uh, footprint that you see on the variant site plan without need for a variance. However, the, the purpose of that is that if they did do that, they would have to clear additional trees, which is the, the, the root nature of, of why we're here today seeking variances four and five. I did receive a phone call inquiry from the 
property owners to the property immediately north of this property. A few days ago, uh, Dr. Kim or Dr. Kirsten Kim and Dr. Zofar, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing it, Hassan, they own uh, uh, pro property there located at 351. It's the immediate parcel to the north. Upon discussing the variance case, they sent me an email stating that they have no objections and support the variance application because it was their concern that they wanted to make sure that the applicants in this, in this case were not cutting down extra trees. So after I explained the applicant's desire to preserve the wooded nature of their lot, they, they offered their support for this case. Otherwise, in summary, it was staff recommendation to approve variants one, two, and three as case V2249 successfully meets all five of the criteria. However, to deny variances four and five as V2249 failed to meet the one criteria for granting said variances. Thank you, Mr. Hanson. Any questions, Mr. Young? If, those, if the word road wasn't there, they wouldn't meet any of these variances, right? That's correct. If the word road was not on any of these easements, we wouldn't be here today for this variance case. Thank you. Mr. Feller? Just one question. We're looking at these as five separate variances because of the whole if one thing is damaged and it's not just providing just a general variance change for the whole property. It's just for these, for these buildings. Exactly. So variances one, two, and three are measurements. One is for the, exist the southmost point of the existing house and variance two is for the southern shed. Variance three is for the shed just to its north. And then variance four and five are for each of the unique setbacks that it's encroaching upon for the proposed uh, accessory building. Thank you. Mr. Bender? The one, one thing that's concerning to me is when I look in the staff recommended conditions and we're talking about the 75%, if something is damaged by 75%, then they have to come into compliance with all of the rules and stuff. I don't think that we need to include the home because I think it would be unfair for them to have to reestablish the location of the home, pay impact fees and all of those things when this is not their fault because of those easements. So if we get to that point, I think that we should eliminate the home out, outside of that requirement. And that is definitely something that is your purvey to do. It was included in my staff report is that is a standard condition that we typically put on uh, ex existing structures within a, a variance application. Any other questions for staff? Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. Is the applicant present? May I get you to come forward, sir? My name is Rebecca You can. And if I could get you to state your name and address for the record, sir. It's David Carson, and I live at 331 North County Road, 415, 32168. All right, sir. And your father? Frank Carson, 508 Venetian Villa Drive, uh, New Smyrna Beach, uh, the previous owner. <coughs> All right, sir. You heard the staff report. Anything you'd like to add to that? To a very good rendition of uh, you know the picture I do want to mention that uh, variance two, just for the language of shed just keep in mind that's the attached garage to my residence it's it's not a separate building or anything mm -hmm. and then the second shed the third variance is just a tool shed for the lawnmower and a bunch of lawn tools uh, the only structure that we've actually built out there since I bought it in 2018 uh, was a pool behind the house. Uh, and so this detached garage, which I like to call it, um, is a much needed uh, uh, area for a very big growing family. My wife of 18 years, Christina, and our three children, I have a 16-year-old that just uh, is getting his license, which means another car out there. 
Um, and I have a 13 and an eight year old, uh, two daughters. Um, I would say that uh, it's no secret, the love of trees and environment. We spent two hurricanes with my children raising squirrels out there. We have, you know, any particular uh, dawn between six and seven, 10 deer out there. We have, we've seen bear. We've literally, I haven't seen it. My dad, uh, uh, maybe if there's a Bible, he might swear by it. He says he saw a Florida cougar, uh, but we have bobcats. Um, we just uh, absolutely love the place. And uh, when mom passed away, uh, you know, he, he had asked, you know, your, your house in Venetian Bay is awfully, awfully pretty. Uh, sure is difficult to take care of this. Um, giant 10 acres, uh, what do you think about doing it professionally, getting it appraised, and having us uh, purchase each other's homes? And we did that in 2018. Um, my dad uh, won't, won't discuss his strategic planning ability, but he had a, a long career in the military, in the Army, he's a retired colonel, and from the day he flew over with my mother looking at the beautiful Volusia County, Sam Sula, New Smyrna, he identified from the very beginning that little dirt 415 Old Tomoka Farms Road which sits in between Cabbage Patch and the racetrack of New Smyrna, literally identified within a couple feet the best way to pull out of that gate to where it's the safest from a visual aspect. Now the road, easement, utility, and or slash road from talking to council we wanted to know a little background as to why this thing says road. If there's any error using that language, it would be the error using that. It's understood from an attorney I talked to that it was typical at the time when you were building big developments. When you didn't identify the road coming in off of 415 yet, to call everything a road. And so that's what they did is they just said and or road and apparently it prevented more permitting. And so what happened is all the properties along 415, they just encircled with this and or road. The reality is if we actually try to put a road in through these properties, you wouldn't believe how much your office would be filled with complaints. There's no way we could have a road running through our properties. But Anyway, um, this 30 by 60 uh, building, I want to you know, walk you all the way up from, there's an oval circle, if you think of the crest at the top, from the property to the south, which I was able to afford to buy in 2010, when my dad had to sell it to help some family financially. Um, I was able to buy that from another builder that turned around when I gave him my card and said no way I could afford that. After the financial crisis, he called me up and said, hey, I need to, need to sell it. My dad lived in fear of the southern property being sold and somebody blasting the trees. And so since 2010, I've owned that parcel and absolutely love it. Uh, that's the road that is in consideration for variance, it's my own property. So I wanna point that out. The property to my, west, uh, to my east is multiple buildings and farms. If you can see, we, we provided you pictures and the good doctors that live uh, just to the north that bought that property uh, come over and uh, are just jaw dropped seeing how beautiful that, that neighborhood is. So the key is, is I want you to, you to look at, you know, Raising this property six feet above the 100 flood zone and the fact that uh, this sited building that we're putting in, this detached garage, the reason it's there, and we went back and continued to move it all the way up to inches before it got to the beautiful St. Augustine, the banana trees, the pomelo trees, the cherry trees, the cypress trees my dad planted around the pond. You know, multiple, multiple, things analogous to your mission here, which I've read and I can summarize by just being neighborly. Uh, neighborly to humans, neighborly to the animals, and neighborly to the fauna. So I like to call it 100 feet setback minus the 81 feet. 
So we're talking 19 feet on a 10 acre parcel that I'm asking permission on my bordering property to the south and 26 feet, 100 minus 64 approximately, to my neighbor to the east. Why in the world can I not find 26 feet and 19 feet on the back corner of this property? Because of the unbelievable cost for new irrigation, I've got all these beautiful trees, the angle in which we are to come into this garage is very difficult when you actually go to measure it. And so we pulled it as far away from that east and south side as we possibly could in order to comply. But um, I meant when I said that crest, all of the south property that I own that has nothing developed is C zone, flood zone C, the high elevation. My dad did all the mapping back in the day and he noticed that that crest which is right behind the house he built. Behind that is all flood zone A. If we were to actually take that building and put it anywhere else outside of the, the yard, we would be looking at thousands and thousands of yards of dirt, a new road, mowing down those hardwood pines, and multiple other disruptions of the animal life. And thank you, I went way beyond those three minutes. I'd <laughs> like to, for the engineering side, allow my dad to maybe answer questions as well. Okay, you just want him to make a comment or answer questions? And comment. <laughs> I, I, uh, <clears throat> I think that was pretty well covered. The big, the big thing that keeps kind of in my craw was the folks and when I permitted the house came out and actually flagged because I told them which the easement I wanted for for utility, the, it's underground electric out there that feeds the, that feeds the house. N nowhere were they considering that to be a road or if you go to Spring Forest subdivision, they're all 10 acre sites and all of them have a road around them. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. Um, the, back when that was being developed, um, there was a main a road called Watermelon Lane, it's now blocked off, that actually was in there and they were still permitting and whatever it may be. And so they put roads, just like was mentioned, around everything. Now they have a spring forest road that closed off Watermelon. The other, I think it was Lettuce Lane or whatever, uh, that they were contemplating making that the main road so it was an issue of where, how we're gonna get in there and where the roads were gonna go. So historically, that's why everything's road. But yeah. in reality, take the roads out of all those properties other than the ones on mm -hmm. a road. And, uh, and I suppose folks would be up here if they wanna build anything. Ours is not the only one in non-compliance in today's terms. Okay. There are a lot, of, a lot of structures out there that are, that are not in compliance, including yeah. my house. But well, let's see if we've got any uh, questions from our commission here for you, and uh, we'll go from there. Not Do we have any questions? Not the applicants. Let's see if anybody else would like to speak about this case, and if not, we're gonna move on, okay? Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Do we have anybody else that would like to speak to this case, Ms. Flowers? No, sir. Okay, and there's nobody in the audience that would like to speak, so. We're gonna close the floor to public participation and open up for commission discussion. What I might add a little bit here is, you gotta keep in mind this is A1 property. It's agricultural property. If this was agricultural use, they could go to the property line. And it's a big piece of property and, and we're not asking for you know feet. I mean, I, we're asking for tens of feet. And uh, I, I, I would, going back to Mr. Bender's comment about the the, rec uh, the conditions, I'd like to see both of them stricken myself. Okay, anybody else? It's on page six. Which conditions you say you want stricken? One and three. Okay. 
I don't see any reason for either one because you're looking at uh, the you're going to. Uh, well, yeah, I agree with you. I don't see any mm -hmm. need for those two restrictions either with that piece of property. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, but would we, we remove? We couldn't strike the word one. road from the variances. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I make a motion, Chair. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mr. Bender. That we approve B twenty two zero four nine, all five variances, and striking the two staff recommendations. I'll second that. Mm -hmm. Okay, I got a motion to approve variances one through five on B twenty two zero four nine, and we're striking the staff recommended conditions from Mr. Uh, Bender and a second from Mr. Young. Any discussion on the motion? The only thing I would like to say is I'm your neighbor to the south off of 415. It's a beautiful area. Thank you for preserving trees. Okay. All right, we're going to take a vote. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Okay, Ms. Shelley. Case number V-22-051, a variance to the minimum yard requirements on prime agricultural A1 zoned property. <clears throat> okay. Let's see. This is Miss Jackson. Yes, sir. So there is one variance request um, associated with this application. It's to reduce the east side yard from 50 feet to 41.3 feet for an existing covered porch. So the property is located at 1441 South US Highway 1 in Oak Hill. It is an A1 zone property and it is a conforming parcel. So in 2018, new owners purchased the property and their intent was to live on it and use it to grow trees that they use in their art business. They do wood carvings and they sell the wood carvings in a local shop, I believe in New Smyrna. In 2019, they constructed a 40 by 80 metal building like a, one of those barndoniums types of buildings where it contains their living quarters, a garage, a large storage area and workshop area all in the same building. And the owners at that time thought because it was an agricultural building and um, you know they're growing trees and in processing the wood on the property that they didn't need to pull a permit for that, that it was ag, ag exempt. However, because it contains their living quarters and the garage workshop area, it does actually require a permit. So they were issued a notice of violation for building without a permit in 2020, March of 2020, and they're wanting to resolve that issue by pu pulling a building permit. And because the existing building has a, a front porch, if I can show a picture of it, that front porch right there it covers the entryway to their living quarters of that building. Um, that is what requires the variance. All, the whole rest of the bu building meets the required setbacks. Um, this porch encroaches approximately nine feet into the side yard. Being A1, the applicable setbacks are 100 feet from the front and 50 feet from the sides and the rear. So just this porch is um, within that setback. However, it's about 40 some feet from the actual property line. Um, but over, it, it's over like 600 feet to the nearest resident. This property is adjacent to a large grove and there's, n there's no houses or anything like that within um, visibility to this structure. So when we review the uh, variance request against our criteria, we still have to recommend a denial as we find that it fails to meet two of the criteria. We find that it fails criteria one and two. There are no sep the special circumstances associated with the property and the need for the variance is due to actions of the applicant. However, we do find that it meets criteria three, four, and five literal interpretation of the code may cause an unnecessary hardship as it would require removal of the porch. The porch is 41.3 feet from the property line and not visible to any adjacent neighbors. Like I said, it's over 600 feet away from the nearest residence. Um, the variance is the minimum to allow the applicants to obtain a building permit for the structure as it's been constructed. 
and we don't find it to be injurious to the area. We have provided two conditions for your consideration should the applicant provide competent and substantial evidence to approve the variance. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Any questions for staff? Okay, I see the applicants here. If you state your name and address for the record, sir. Good morning, Mark Davis, 4626 Cow Creek Road, Edgewater. All right, so you've heard the staff uh, report. Is there anything you'd like to add to that? Yes, I would like to add some updated information and possibly some new information. And I'm gonna turn so I can speak to the slides. Okay. If we could have slide two, please. Or next slide, please. I don't know if my pointer is going to work. So where that indicator is on the building mm -hmm. is the building in question. To the left is the overhanging porch that's in question concerning uh, being, in, uh, being into the setback requirement. The setback requirements, as Ms. Jackson stated, are 50 feet to the property line. And this is a very irregular shaped parcel it is L-shaped, and uh, we'll be able to see that better once we see the survey. However, it's only 160 feet, 163 feet wide as you approach from US-1 to get into the property. The property uh, may even meet criteria one of special conditions of the land and the building because this area of the property is the highest part of the property and is designated with the X designation by FEMA. So it is the, the driest area of the property. Secondly, there's old growth oak and other timber on the property behind it. The owners, because of the business that they're in, did not want to take down any more trees than necessary. They like to harvest approximately three old growth trees a year for their business, and then they aggressively plant at a approximate ratio of 20 to one new pines and cedars on the property. So they didn't want to put the building anywhere on the property where they could replant trees or have to take down trees on the property. Uh, if we realize that to either side of the building uh, an owner could build, if they wanted to, up to 50 feet to the property of their property line, which on either case would mean that the least distance to any building to the right or to the left would exceed 100 feet. The building, as Ms. Jackson noted, does meet the setback requirements. It's just that the owners did not realize that in an agricultural exempt property, they could not have living quarters of which we are addressing. You want the slide changed? Yes, please. Next slide, please. Okay, thank you. This shows a view from the east and you can see the overhang on the building right now. And if I could highlight the property as it comes in from, from the highway, I see I get a, a laser mark up above but not on the screen. Nevertheless, it, it is L-shaped. And if you could just come east now, please, and go around the perimeter of the property. It was critical that the building be placed where it was for the agricultural and art operation of their ag exemption and feel perhaps that maybe we do meet four out of the five criteria. And what is in question is actually the overhang and whether or not it could be granted a variance. Next slide, please. The survey shows this in detail. It also, on the right-hand bottom corner, shows that the area in question, the first acre coming into the property, is flood zone X. Next slide, please. 
from the air, it's very difficult to determine that the trees were planted in rows, but formerly a, an operation known as Heavenly Tree Farm and Nursery planted these oak trees perhaps 40 to 50 years ago. Some of the trees were destroyed in storms and you see some in the foreground there, but typically they harvest three to four trees a year. Next slide, please. This is the replanting in the open areas of both pines and cedars. Next slide. The old growth timber that is harvested is then taken to a sawmill where it's processed into boards and slabs. Next slide. They are stored in three areas of the metal building. They are air dried, they are spaced, put on spacers and air dried until they get to the determined amount of moisture that then they want to work with and turn into art. Next slide. This is one area of the building where they store the material. Next slide. Another area. And then the next one, please and then the slabs, and then the next slide. This is the actual processing of the material, and it is cut, shaped, and chiseled into different art forms. In the foreground, you see a seahorse. Uh, David is an amazing artist. He has galleries on Canal Street and New Smyrna Beach, and I marvel as I walk through the gallery and I see what this young man is capable of doing. Next slide, please. They also, this is their gallery, and it, they are showing here some raw edge slabs, as well as some of the artwork that they do. Next slide. They also make furniture. They store finished product in a temperature controlled room that they have. Some of it is shipped for the orders that are purchased on the internet, and the others are displayed in their gallery and sold there. With the information that I've provided, I hope that there's a better understanding of why the building was placed where it was and how integral this building is and the oper to the total operation of what they do for a living. If I can answer any questions, I'd be glad to do so. Any questions, Mr. Bell? Just one. Um, are you getting the permit? Are you? They said the building was built without permits. Is this all to get the permits to legitimize the building? The first step the is first to step get is the variance because the variance. if we have to deal yep. with that, we need to do it before we submit for permitting. Yep. Perfect. That's all I've got. Thank you so much. Any other questions for the applicant? All right, sir. Let's see if we have any public participation, okay? Sure. Ms. Flowers, is there anybody who'd like to speak to this case? We have a Mr. Corbett. Corbett? online, but he does not wish to speak. Okay. And we do not have anybody in the audience that would like to speak, so we're going to close the floor for public participation and open them up for commission discussion. One thing I would like to say is I would like to see condition two struck on this if we approve the variance. <coughs> okay. Any discussion or motion? I'm prepared to make a motion if we get close. Okay, Mr. Feller. In case V22051, um, I make a motion that we grant variance request, variance number one, with the staff recommended conditions one, three, and four. Okay, do we have a second? And we got a second. Okay, we got a motion to approve variance 22051 with from Mr. Feller with the staff recommended conditions one, three, and four. So we're striking condition two and a second from Mr. Sixma. Any discussion on the motion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Chair, does, do you understand that that's the 75% if it's demolished? You, you understand that that's gone now, but it, it legitimizes the structure? You want to, okay, perfect. I just wanted to make sure. I guess we should have asked if you understood the conditions, but yeah. 
Also, uh, I should have addressed this, but we do have the vesting rights. We do have a, a letter from the planning department stating that uh, they recognize that we do have the vested rights. All right. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Ms. Shelley, could I get the next case, please? Case number B-22-052, a variance to minimum yard requirements on transitional agricultural A3 and resource corridor, RZ, RC, zoned property. Mr. Hanson, this is your case. Good morning once again. Um, var variance case 2252 is a variance application to allow for a proposed accessory structure for the garage on the property. Um, as you're aware, the, the, the property is split zone, both A3 and RC. The portion of the A3 portion is 1.07 acres, so it is conforming um, to the actual zoning code. Um, it's in an airport overlay, otherwise the property is atypical. It's an atypical lot. It, it, filters into Spruce Creek. Otherwise, it fronts on Letha Street. Uh, the building, the house, single family residence was built back in 1982. The applicants purchased the property in November of 2017. In order to build their proposed accessory structure, they also purchased an additional half lot adjacent to the south side of their residents in 2019 so that they would be able to have enough area to build the accessory structure that they're looking at. Um, however, because the, access, the detached accessory structure measures 36 feet by 40 feet, um, in the A3 zoning classification, the applicable setbacks for the structure or, or for the zoning class would be 40 feet in the front, 40 feet on a waterfront, and 25 feet on the, the sides. The, if you look at the variance site plan that's been attached, the variance one, it seeks to reduce the actual 25 foot setback to 10.2 to fit the proposed accessory structure for a new garage onto the property. It, just to give you a little bit more history over the property, is it was developed as part of Cliff Subdivision back in 1954 when it was platted. The subject property has been administratively rezoned twice since the original plat. At the time that it was platted, it was zoned R1A, and at the time the house was permitted for construction back in 1982, it was zoned R3. In 1992, it was then administratively rezoned once again to its current zoning classification. At the time that the house was constructed, the proposed detached garage would meet the applicable setbacks for the R3 zoning. Now, as that would have allowed for a 20 foot combined side yard with a minimum of eight feet on any one particular side. So if this property hadn't been administratively rezoned to A3, we wouldn't be here today once again, um, for this case anyways. The property, uh, uh, is part of the new Smyrna Beach interlocal service boundary agreement area. So within that ISBA, they apply for building permits through the actual city. However, we, we, we deal with the actual variance applications. And so on the, you'll, you'll see on the variance site plan there, there is a dock that is, is pretty close that was recently constructed that, that's not part of this variance application. Uh, on the initial site plan, it said proposed doc. That was permitted through the city of New Smyrna Beach, just so everybody's clear on that portion. Uh, for my analysis and recommendation regarding the side yard setback variance to allow for this proposed shed, I found that it met all five of the criteria with the recommendation of approval, noting the special circumstance that due to the administrative rezoning of this residential neighborhood that the subject property is part of, um, that's why the setback had been increased from the what would have been possibly 10 feet to 25 feet. Uh, the re administrative rezoning was not 
obviously the actions of the applicants. The, it was done prior to the applicants buying the property. The little interpretations of the provisions of the zoning ordinance would not necessarily deprive the applicant of commonly held rights in the A3 zoning classification, but they would likely work in undue hardship as the subdivision was intended to be developed under lesser setback requirements. And it's the minimum necessary variance to, to uh, reduce the setback to grant the proposed accessory structure. And I, believe, I was on, working on the assumption that granting this variance is not anticipated to be injurious to the area as most properties developed within the area were developed under the same setbacks of that R3 zoning classification and not under the setbacks of the A3 zoning classification. Otherwise, the, the applicants buying that extra half lot, you know, they, they tried to add the, the extra space to their property to fit this. Um, and that gave them, I think, the, the room to physically put it on their location because with the way that they, they cited the property, uh, the purpose of this accessory structure, I, I, from my understanding after speaking with them, was to allow for potential vehicles, but also for potential uh, ease of access for watercraft so that they can go out to their new dock that's immediately west of this proposed accessory detached structure. Um, now that said, I, uh, I, it was my recommendation to approve the variance in this case as it did meet all five of the said criteria for granting the variance. Thank you, Mr. Hanson. Any questions for staff? Okay, is the applicant present? Good morning, sir. If I could get your name and address for the record. Certainly. Good morning. My name's Dennis DeBello. I live at 2717 Letha, New Smyrna Beach. And um, I thank Mr. Hansen for his uh, presentation. I don't know if I could add much to it, but I'm here to answer any of your questions. Okay, the young lady behind you, would you like to speak? Good morning, all. Yes. My name is Maria DeBello, 2717 Letha. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. And you've heard the staff comments, and you just, you, you were, you're here to answer any questions. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay, do we have any questions for the applicant? I only have one, and I think Mr. Bedford answered it, but I'll, I'll ask, uh, uh, or Mr. Bedford, I'm sorry, Hanson asked. Um, I was looking at the land and thinking, why wouldn't you build it somewhere else? But he was saying you're building it in proximity so that water vehicles can have easy access to the dock. Is that why you're putting it in the location you chose? Well, yes, that plus that area, I think there's a picture in your packet. That area is already cleared. It's already leveled. There's minimal impact on the property. And with the septic tank being where it is and the other, saying, yeah. other um, side of the house, the only other place to put the garage would be in the front yard. And the front yard's got enough setback for it, but then it would be completely disruptive to the neighborhood. Okay, any other questions for the applicant? All right, sir, let's see if we have any public participation. Thank you, sir. Ms. Flowers, do we have anyone? No, sir. Is there anyone here that'd like to speak to this case? Hearing none, we're going to close the floor. Public participation and open up for commission discussion or a motion. I'll be glad to make a motion. Okay. Case number B-22-052, a variance to minimum yard requirements on transitional A3 and resource corridors on zoned property be approved subject to staff comment. I'll second. Okay. And how many recommendations do they have? One. Just one? one. Okay. All right, we've got a motion for to approve variance 22-052 with the one staff recommended condition from Ms. Shelley and a second from Mr. Costa. Mm -hmm. Any discussion on the motion? And that's for vari approval of variance one. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, motion carries unanimously. Michelle, <coughs> can we get the next one you read it for the record, please? Case number Z-22-053, a rezoning from urban single-family residential R4 zoning classification to the urban two-family residential R6 zoning classification. Okay, Ms. Smith, good morning, ma'am. Good morning. Uh, for the record, Trish Smith, Planning and Development Services. This is an application for a rezoning, rezoning from urban single-family residential 
to urban two-family residential. It's um, slightly less than an acre of property, and the rezoning will allow a remodel of an existing structure from a single-family home to a duplex. The future land use designation in this area is urban medium residential, which allows four to eight units per acre. The property is located on State Road 44, and that's East New York Avenue. There are a variety of zoning classifications in the area. We've got single family, multifamily, and we do have some commercial. This home was built in the 20s, so it predates our zoning ordinance, and it's non-conforming to the zoning code. But our ordinance does allow existing structures to be altered as long as they don't expand the nonconformity. The applicant plans to renovate under the existing roof, and they're not going to encroach further into the setbacks. It will be remodeled into two one-bedroom units, one-bedroom, one-bath units, which we view as a, a s slight addition to our affordable housing issue in the area. And with that, we request that you would forward this application to the County Council with a recommendation of approval. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Any questions for staff? Okay, we can see where we go with this. Is the applicant present? Can I get your name and address for the record, please? Kayla Troy, and our office address is 312 South Lakeview Drive, Lake Helen. Okay, and you've heard the staff report. Anything you'd like to add to it? Um, I would just like to add that uh, everything they said is correct. It's a beautiful historic house. We don't really want to modify anything on the outside or the existing footprint. Just want to create more affordable housing in that area. And it's a vacant structure. Uh, we did have. Um, you know, some issues with the front porch being occupied by, you know, people wandering down the road. So we do want to improve that from where it stands now. Okay. Any questions for the applicant? Let's see if we have any public participation, okay? Mm -hmm. Do we have any public participation, Ms. Flowers? No, sir. Okay. We'll close the floor for public participation over to commission discussion or a motion. I'll be glad to make a motion. Okay. <laughs> uh, that case number Z22-053 forward the rezoning application to the county council for final action with a recommendation of approval. Second. Okay, I got a motion from Ms. Shelley to <coughs> forward the rezoning application case number Z22053 to county council for final action with recommendation of approval and a second from Mr. Sixma. Any discussion on the motion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Thank Any you. opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Shelley, could I get the next case, please? Yes, sir. Case number PUD-22-054, rezoning from the urban two-family R6 classification to the planned unit development PUD zoning classification. Thank you, Ms. Shelley. And... Ms. Jackson. Yes, sir. So this is a request to rezone um, a 2.35 acre parcel from R6, which is a two family zoning classification to planned unit development with a mixed subclassification. The property is located at 962 Derbyshire Road in the Daytona Beach area. Uh, the future land use of the property is urban medium intensity. The property is a conforming parcel. It's currently um, owned and developed by First United Methodist Church of Port Orange. It has a house of worship on it, and it includes a sanctuary building, another building, which I'm going to call a community building, a parsonage, and a community garden um, on the property. The owners, in partnership with Halifax Urban Ministries, propose to expand the allowable uses on the property to provide a temporary shelter and social services to homeless veterans. The intent is to renovate the existing buildings to provide up to 26 shelter rooms. And they would also include some additional support uses, such as counseling and a cafeteria dining hall for those veterans that would be living at the um, shelter. So in order to allow those additional uses, um, they have to rezone the property from the current R6 to the mixed planned unit development zoning class classification. The MPUD zoning is compatible with the urban medium intensity land use and um, with the surrounding mix of uses. 
Uh, the property fronts on Derbyshire. There's a commercial strip center adjacent to the north. Uh, there's multifamily uses within the city of Daytona Beach um, on the east side and the south side and single family residential to the east. And the property is served by the Votran bus route on Derbyshire Road. Here's a picture of the, um, it's actually the existing site plan, um, but with the new uses included on it to function as the um, <coughs> proposed uh, preliminary plan for the development agreement. So I'm going to walk through the development agreement. It's a very simple development agreement because this isn't a, a, a gigantic develop, uh, proposal for a PUD. It's just allowing the existing church to continue and expand the uses to allow for up to 26 shelter rooms. So the uses are the homeless shelter, limited to 26 shelter rooms, a house of worship, support offices for the existing church and the veteran services, cafeteria, dining hall, and counseling services, the community center, which I assume is the multi-purpose building, and the community garden in the rear. The development standards, um, it shall meet all applicable development standards that are provided for in the preliminary plan or the land development code. Under phase one development, which is what we're discussing right now, we're not intending that they have to go through site plan because it's already developed. They're just going to be doing internal renovations. Should, however, in the future they wish to expand the uses to um, serve additional populations or additional veterans, then it would trigger the need to go through uh, a re uh, revised rezoning, revised PUD, and a full site plan review. Uh, when we re review the zoning criteria for this, we find that it's consistent with the comp plan. The urban medium intensity future land use allows a mix of residential and non-residential -resi uses, and pursuant to the matrix, the MPUD zoning classification is considered compatible with the urban medium intensity future land use. It's not anticipated to have negative impact on the environment or natural resources. It's already developed. Um, the, effort, the effect on the economy or the value of the area, the property is currently developed with the house of worship and that use is intended to continue. The additional use of a very limited veteran shelter is not anticipated to negatively impact the economy or the value of the area. It will meet concurrency requirements. And it's anticipated to have a positive impact on the public health, safety, and welfare as the rezoning is in support of needed services to homeless veterans. So with that, staff does recommend that the board forward this application to the county council with a recommendation of approval subject to the staff recommended order and resolution. I'm happy to answer any questions or the applicants are in the audience as well available for questions. Thank you, Ms. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Any questions for staff? Mr. Feller. <laughs> no, I have one. Um, it's R6 currently. Um, do they have, is it running as a special exemption for the house of worship right now or is it just be predate our, our no, zoning? No, houses of worship are allowed in all are zoning allowed classes. In our, perfect, yeah. thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Okay, and no other questions for the staff? Is the applicant present? Good morning, Mr. Watts. Good morning. You can say that still, right? Good morning. <laughs> um, for the record, uh, Mark Watts with the law firm of Cobb Cole, 231 North Woodland Boulevard, uh, Deland. Appreciate the opportunity to, to be here uh, this morning. Um, we're here on behalf of, of both First United Methodist Church of Port Orange and Halifax Urban Ministries. Got Buck James, Executive Director of the Halifax Urban Ministries with me. Ted Servasic, Chairman of the Board, is also here uh, with me. And I'd be remiss in not recognizing Mika Husseini, who's done uh, the yeoman's work on, on this application that's here before you today. Um, really don't have a whole lot to add. I do want to thank staff for all their hard work. We've, this has been kind of a collaborative effort to put this together and, and bring it to you. Um, as you know, this meets a, a significant need uh, in the community. This is actually being uh, made possible by both a Veterans Administration grant uh, to the tune of about a million dollars and matching funds coming through the Community Services Department at Volusia County um, to, to help uh, bring this to fruition. I do want to let you know that we, um, on Tuesday night, 
Um, we, we sent out a notice to all the surrounding property owners to um, bring everybody onto the site, answer any questions that they might have. We had about four people show up, had a great conversation. Uh, Miss Betty wanted to know how she could you know, let everybody know she was good with it. Um, but uh, anyway, it was a good conversation, um, and uh, I think we answered any any all questions that were there. Happy to do the same with anything you might have. But we appreciate the staff's uh, support and, and effort on this, and uh, we're here to answer your questions. Mr. Young? Um, yeah. By the way, I've been there many a times. I live about five yeah. blocks from the place, and I was there at the grand opening of the, of the community garden. You're not, first thing, I guess you're getting rid of the light new shop because that's the building that you're using, right? The, the, the current light new shop. The plan right now is that the tra transitional housing goes into the building, the, the old Sunday school building in the back. Um, yeah, which is now, the, which was the light new shop at this time. And, the cr and those uses there will be transitioned into, and Buck, I don't know if you want to come up and address any of this, but uh, they're going to be transitioned into. Because I was just at the light new shop two <laughs> weeks ago. Yeah, into the sanctuary is the multi-purpose room. But oh, you're going to move it that way. Yes, our intention is to name an address for the record, sir, if oh, you don't I'm mind. Sorry. My name is Buck James. I serve as the executive director at Halifax Urban Ministries. Okay. And yes, our intention is to continue those services that are being provided. They'll need to be moved, some of them, into other buildings. Some of them will go into what is currently the sanctuary, which will become a multi-purpose room, which will continue to be able to serve as a sanctuary on Sundays, but in other uses during the rest. Okay, because so because I know a lot of people use the, that light new shop because I run a light new shop for my church. Uh, you're not going to do anything to affect the community garden in any way because that's a beauty. You keep that grounds beautiful, by the way. I may comment that for everybody. That's you. You do keep your gra area very nice. Yes, our community garden is a great success, and we intend to keep it and to expand it if possible. Fantastic. Um, that's my comment. I think it's an excellent use of the property. Ms. Shelley, did you have a I comment? I just had a comment. Um, that was the old Derbyshire Place site, mm -hmm. which was also involved with the church as well, wasn't mm -hmm. it? Yes. yes. Great. Thank you. Yes, and, and just for your information, uh, Halifax Urban Ministries is an official outreach ministry of the Florida United Methodist Church. That's why it makes uh, sense for us to partner in this effort uh, with uh, uh, First United Port Orange, who has been operating the uh, Derbyshire Place property and uh, had approached us about this. And then Miguel has moved on somewhere else. Will he be? No, Miguel will oh. become an He'll employee be. of Halifax oh, Urban Ministries. Oh, great. Yeah. Okay, that's good to hear. As will the other part-time staff that are working there. Just excellent to work with. He's Mr. Feller? You. You the only thing I wanted to say was, I mean, to have two cases in a row where affordable or transitional restorative housing are addressed is really awesome. I mean, just for Volusia County is really awesome. So, yeah. It's, it, it is good to make some progress. So. Any other questions for the applicant? Okay, we're going to see if we have any public participation. Do we have any, Ms. Blau? No, sir. Okay, we're going to close the floor for public participation, open for commission discussion or a motion. I'll, I'll make a motion. motion. Uh, oh, excuse me. I'll be glad to make a motion. Case number PUD 22-054, rezoning from the urban two-family R6 to the planned unit development zoning classification be approved subject to staff's comments and resolution. I'll second. Okay, I got <coughs> a motion from Ms. Shelley to forward the rezoning application case number PUD 22054 to County, County Council for final action and recommendation of approval subject to staff recommended conditions and a second from Mr. Young. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Good, Good job. job. Good job. All that for that. <laughs> <laughs> All that weight. <laughs> okay, Miss Shelley, can I get the next case read in the record, please? Yes, sir. Case number V-22-056, variances to the minimum yard requirements on urban single-family residential R3 zoned property. Okay, and this is Miss Jackson also. Yes, sir. Okay, there are four variances associated with this, but only three would be applicable. This is a little bit unusual. <laughs> so variance one is to reduce the south, the south side yard from 10 feet to 7 feet for an existing wall protrusion. Variance two is to reduce 
the north side yard from 10 feet to 9.8 feet to legitimize the ex location of the existing house. Variance three is to reduce the front yard from 30 feet to 25.8 feet for a proposed uh, six by 22.2 feet balcony. And variance four is to reduce the front yard from 30 feet to 29.1 feet for an existing 5.5 by 12 foot cantilevered balcony. Variance four is only needed in the event that variance three is not granted. The property is located at 4012 South Peninsula Drive, Port Orange. It's zoned R3 and RC. It, as you can see on the map, it's one of those really long lots that the very small portion of it on land is what's developable. The rest is out into the water and the mangrove islands, and that part's zoned RC. Um, it is a lawful non-conforming lot. Uh, the applicable setbacks for the R3 zone are uh, front is 30 feet, sides are 20 feet combined with a minimum of eight in one side yard and the waterfront is 25 feet. So a little bit of history about the property. It was um, developed in 1984 with a single family house. Between 1984 and 2010, there was a couple of different owners and they all undertook to renovate the house uh, the original house, and in looking through the permit history, um, they have enclosed a rear porch, they've extended the first floor and second floor living areas, they've renovated the front of the house, and they've installed a summer kitchen in the rear of the house. So there were past <coughs> code violations for work without permits, and as a result, our permit history on this particular property isn't very reflective of what's actually built out there, and that has been somewhat frustrating for the current owners to try to nail down what exactly has been approved on the property and what hasn't. So in 2016, the current owners purchased the property unaware of all this past history, and they now want to update the house as well. Um, they'd like to extend the balcony across the front facade of the house and then renovate the back porch and summer kitchen area. They'd like to be able to utilize the existing footprint of the house. And in order to be able to do that and obtain building permits for these improvements, we have to um, come before the board with variance requests to address some of these existing issues. Um, so I'm gonna discuss each of the variances uh, separately. So variance one, I call it the bat bump out. It, let's put my drawing tool on. So it's this, it's just this little bump out area right here. And that was, um, it was previously permitted to expand the rear of the house and increase the living area and include a first floor summer kitchen and open porch above it. And then there was a spiral staircase provided, um, that provided access between the floors back in this corner. That was all permitted, and the permitting plans showed that it met setbacks, but somehow it got built with this little bump out area here. So it, 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 uh, it protrudes out approximately three feet into the required uh, set for, uh, setback. So the owners now wish to renovate this back area, and because there, this area might be um, load bearing, some of the, uh, you can see it in these pictures here, They've kind of got it torn apart a little bit, but it's just these, it's this situation here. They want to be able to utilize that because without doing so would cause kind of some major renovations to the existing house. Um, and so therefore, the first variance. Variance two is to legitimize the north side yard. Um, that should have been 10 feet. It's 9.8 feet. It's a very minor discrepancy, but um, including it in this variance application in an abundance of caution to legitimize the location of their existing house. Variance three is for a new balcony. As you can see in this picture down here, there is a balcony that's currently there. That balcony is a, what's called a cantilevered balcony. They would like to uh, renovate that and extend the balcony across the front of the house and make it a little bit deeper, another foot deeper, 
And in so doing, they have to put support posts on either side of the driveway that goes in here. The variance request is to those support posts. The rest of the house is gonna stay where it is. In the event that that variance does not get approved, then the ex existing cantilevered balcony will require a variance in order to legitimize its location. Um, it extends 5.5 feet from the front facade of the house. And the zoning code allows cantilevered balconies that extend into the front yard up to 3.5 feet. In this case, the minimum front yard is 30 feet. So the balcony must maintain a 26.5 foot front yard. Because the house is, at, is actually set back a little bit further, it's at 31.1 feet, uh, the existing balcony has to maintain a 25.6 front yard. Because it's a little wider than three and a half feet, it actually ends up encroaching into the front yard 10.8 inches or 0.9 feet. So uh, it, when we reviewed the permit files, we actually don't find a permit for this balcony. The original house didn't have a balcony on it. The, the, we did find uh, renovations that did show a balcony, but it wasn't this balcony. So I'm not quite sure how it got there, but it's there. So as I said, this, va this variance is only being requested in the event that variance three is not approved. So when we analyze all these variances, variance one to the bump out, variance two to the side yard over here, and variance three to the existing cantilevered balcony, we find that they successfully meet all the criteria and recommend approval. There are special circumstances associated with the property. The house has existed in its current configuration for many years prior, prior to the current ownership. Um, uh, of the property and it does have a questionable permit history. The applicants are not responsible for these circumstances. Uh, literal interpretation of the code would require renovation of the rear of the house to remove the three foot protrusion, remove approximately five inches from the front balcony and shifting the entire house about three inches to the south, which we consider that an unnecessary hardship as it, the house has existed in its current configuration since at least 2010, it appears. These are the minimum variances to allow the applicants to legitimize the existing house and apply for future permits. And we don't find that granting these variances will be injurious to the area involved. It has existed um, this way since at least 2010 without complaint. With regard to variance three, which is the expanded balcony, we do find that it fails to meet four of the five criteria and therefore must recommend denial. With respect to this variance, we don't find that there are special circumstances associated with the land or the house that would trigger the need for this variance. It is due, the need for the variance is due to the um, current owners wanting to update the front facade with a larger balcony. And the balcony is designed to cover the garage entrance with a support post located on either side. And as I explained before, we have to go to the first vertical face. So that's just the post. So there's just two posts on either side of the driveway that are triggering the variance request. Literal, literal interpretation of the code does not deprive the applicants of commonly enjoyed rights. However, we do find that it meets criteria five. It's unlikely that this variance would be injurious to the area involved. The current balcony exists at uh, five feet deep. They're just adding one additional foot of depth and two support columns. And we don't think it would actually be very discernible to the appearance of the front yard or the front yard setback. And further, the properties on the other side of the street are zoned R9, which allows a 25 foot setback. So it would look in keeping with the actual neighborhood in the area. So with that, we have provided um, four conditions for consideration should the applicants provide competent and substantial evidence for this board to support the variance requests. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Any, Mr. Feller? I have one question, Ms. Jackson. So not that this is gonna be, but if we denied variance number three, you said that that cantilever balcony was done without the, without the idea of permits right now, would they, 
would, if we denied that, would it, could they just keep operating that? I mean, want to make sure it's obviously permitted. I think that doing a new one, obviously, I'm assuming there'd be permits. We'll hear from the, from them, but would that be, if we denied that, would they have to get after the fact permits for that cantilever balcony that's exactly existing? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Okay, anybody have any questions? The applicant press. I'm Ronald Romani, how you doing? Okay. Uh, 4012 South Peninsula. Okay. And this is my wife, Eileen. Eileen Mulvaney, 4012 South Peninsula Drive. All right. So you've heard the staff report. Anything you'd like to add? <coughs> well, <coughs> uh, I think our intentions are to uh, try to upgrade to uh, actually make the house look more like the neighborhood, as you can see in the pictures. Uh, at the moment, it's kind of strange looking compared to the houses around it. So we were looking to get um, what we needed to straightened out and taken care of. Like the lady said, it was before we purchased the house and nobody told us about these issues before we purchased, but <clears throat> we were looking to <clears throat> make the front renovations to change the appearance of the house to more conform with the houses around it. And uh, uh, that's the main thing for the front and like I say, on the sides, the structure is, is, is part of the issue. And then of course, on the, on the north side, you know, there's nothing we can do there with a few inches we're off, so. Okay. I know Did you want to, I think Mr. Lyman? Yes. Hey, next, uh, uh, Ryan name? Lyman, 40 star, 47 Lorillard Place, Ormond Beach. Um, I'm a general contractor. I get involved with the Mulvaney's because the south side of their property um, had significant stucco damage. Uh, so we pulled a permit for that work and in the process of working on that, we found that the work was caused, the damage was caused by the summer kitchen and the work that was done on that, um, what is that, the southwest corner of the house. Um, so we tried to open that up as much as we could to reveal to what extent the damage was and contain it. Since we only had a permit to work on that south side, we completed that permit work and then we tried to, uh, we came up with a plan so that we could continue to renovate the property so that we could um, repair the damages and then improve the property to obviously their desire. Uh, in the process of that, we found out that, you know, the two supporting posts uh, for the back porch um, are outside of the setbacks and apparently they're there's no history that they were ever approved there. Um, so uh, regarding that portion of it, we were trying to work with what we had there with the current design. So the current design utilizes those posts and everything to, to, to where it's at now. Um, in the process of getting that to happen, uh, we started talking about some renovations to the front of the home. Um, so uh, as far as the front of the home goes, they wanted to do some things with the front porch, but it was inside of the footprint, but then the balcony as well. Uh, while we were looking at the balcony, the balcony does need some repair at this time. And there's also about a six foot uh, dead valley uh, at the top of where the two roof lines meet. I don't know if you can see it in like, can you get like page, picture 30 or page 30 up there? And so you can also see from like page 30, once, once that comes up, you'll see the front of the house. When I'm looking at the lower picture, you know, the house does look kind of odd, the way that it's kind of configured on the front. As a result of maybe some of those renovations to the left of where that top feature, where the front porch kind of uh, protrudes over the roof line, that's where the Dead Valley is. So part of our work um, to improve the look was also to remove the, the, the roofing issue. And by doing that, we were gonna continue that facade and bring it out across the balcony so that we could get the roof line protruding out the house. And so some of that work that we were doing in the balcony is not just a necessity as far as you know, visual aesthetics, it's also something that we're trying to do so we can improve the flow of, of the water off the roof line. Okay. And so one of the other things I was just gonna um, bring up is that you know, just like she said, um, and I want to thank Susan because she did a lot of hard work on this thing because, like she said, the permitting history on this is a nightmare. Um, 
a lot of the homes in that area are zoned R9. Um, his, his lot zoning is, is very interesting because, you know, the, the separation between 25 and 30 feet is between R4 and R3. And so if you look at the criteria for that, his lot's only 50 foot wide. His square footage is 8,200 square foot. And so he's classified in, an, in a lot that's over 10,000 square foot and minimum 85 foot width. So, I mean, his classification, not that we want to rezone or anything, but I just wanted you to kind of consider where he's at in the scope of things versus what's in the neighborhood and uh, the other zoning. Because once you go past four, basically you have a 25 foot setback in the front yard. Okay. So if you guys have any questions for me. Mr. Young? Uh, I just have one comment. I've been, I was by there. And uh, how deep, first, how deep is that awning, or, I mean that balcony right now? I think it was five feet, five and a half feet, something like that. Okay. We're only moving it out like a foot. Yeah, because none of the others that I cruised down that street, I didn't see hardly. I think one, maybe a two blocks or a block and a half down, had a balcony. None of them in that area had balconies. So, your yours is different because it has a balcony. It, it, it you know, it, the comment that it would meet the the rest of the box. None of the others have a balcony. One across, uh, two across the street down the way does, but yeah, I just, that's my comment. I thought it looked in line with everything else. Mr. Feller? Uh, my only comments are because the, in the setbacks, you're not including any new square footage of the house. It's just Correct. the posts that are Correct. going in that's to support That's the only this. thing, but in yeah. the backyard, it's exactly. two, two posts. In and the in front the yard, it's two posts. And it's, it's not faces, but you, I understand how you have to measure it. Sounds to me as a builder, you're familiar with getting permits and doing it all right. So that if we do the new balcony up front, you're going to do it right, I trust, Correct. and permit it and all that. Yeah, well, the permits, here, here's the crazy thing is that because of COVID and everything else now backed up the county is, this job actually was in permitting and somehow it skipped zoning. So it was in permitting for about three months before zoning got a hold of it. And so there's been significant delays in, to, this, to this project. Hopefully we speed that up. <laughs> so we're very happy to be here today. <laughs> Any other applicant uh, question for the applicant? <coughs> All right, let's see if we have any public participation. I'd also like to add that I have support from the neighbors. Oh, yeah, there's a letter side. in there, too. For, for the neighbor where the seven-foot bump out is, there's a letter. Okay. I talked to the other neighbor, and he said he didn't realize he could send a letter, but if we needed one, he'd be glad to do it. All right. Okay, we'll take that in consideration. Ms. Flowers? No, sir. Okay. We don't have anyone here who'd like to speak to this case. So we're going to close the floor for public participation and open it up for commission discussion. Um, I would just like to see if we want to continue on the recommendation, staff recommendation two. Well, if in an event that, because it's 75% mm -hmm. of the uh, assessed. What was that again? There's 75% in there on this property. Oh. Just in I don't know that. That's. I mean. I, I'll be glad to make a motion. I Okay. Go ahead. Um, case number B-22-056, <coughs> variances to the minimum yard requirements on urban single family residential R3 zoned property to approve variances one, two, and three, subject to staff recommendations and condition, excluding uh, recommendation and condition number two. Second. Do I have a second? Oh, Mr. Feller, second? Okay. We're going to, uh, we got a motion to approve variance 22056, variances one, two, and three. Variance four will not be needed because variance three would be approved and with the staff recommended conditions except for number two. And a second from Mr. Feller. Any discussion on the motion? <coughs> All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Uh, Time, guys. Mr. Chair, if I may, uh, ask to be excused at 1245 for a prior engagement, please. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Shelley, can I get the next case, please? Case number 0 22 060. Or that's not 0, it's an O, excuse me. O 22. <laughs> Zero, six, zero. Um, um, ordinance 2022-10, 20, update to the five-year schedule of capital improvements for concurrency monitored public facilities. Uh, 
FY 2021 through 2022 through 2025, 2026. Okay. Trish Smith, Planning and Development Services, and I will be quick, Mr. Costa, so we can get you out of here. <laughs> uh, this is our schedule of capital improvements. It's an annual requirement by the state of Florida, and it's to ensure that we're meeting our level of service requirements that we set in our comprehensive plan. The county council is required to approve an ordinance each year. It's an exercise that includes a review of our, our council-approved five-year uh, capital improvement plan. It's a coordinated effort with our parks department, our engineering department, our solid waste group, our utilities group, as well as the school district. And we reviewed, um, just a clarification, it was fiscal year 21-22 and fiscal through fiscal year 25-26. And the Community Planning Act mandates a level of service review for solid waste, stormwater, potable water, and sanitary sewer. So we must do those. We also at the county uh, chose to include parks, transportation, and schools in our review. And the bottom line is we found that all of these services do meet the current level of service standards and we recommend that you forward this to the county council <coughs> with a recommendation of approval. Okay. Any questions for staff? Okay, I do have a question. I noticed that part of your um, maintenance for the uh, trails was put into the parks and recreation and culture when you have a trails program over here. Why is that? Trails are considered transportation in our comprehensive plan, so we included it for informational purposes. We do not have level of service standards for trails, but we did include it to bring it to your attention because trails are a hot topic right now at the county. Okay. The other question I have then leading to that would be, we have um, uh, most of our parks and recreation, it looks like it's being funded through the um, uh, general fund, is that correct? I think I see $5,162. It would be whatever the council approved this year. I'm not really okay. familiar with that. And ECHO only funded 400000 of that? Mm -hmm. And then over in the trails program, we've got, of course, the DOT funding portion of that, but th a half of that almost. But we have ECHO funding the other half of $2 million. How come we're funding so much out of ECHO into the trails and not in the parks and recreation. ECHO is sometimes used as a match for DOT funding. DOT provides funding for our trails as transportation corridors, but they don't fund it 100% all the time, so that's when we'll supplement with ECHO. Okay. I guess the reason I'm even asking these questions is because it was approved based upon not only the trails, but all the parks and recreation. You see a disproportionate going to the parks and recreation compared to the trails. Well, we have different funding sources for our trails, um, and it even gets more complicated than that because level of service is what's available to the public in general, and we recently went through a change where we created a new resource, resource stewardship division, so we have additional facilities there, so there would be funding from them, and ECHO is under resource stewardship, and then we also have our trail program through our parks department. So it's really a combination of all those things that you're seeing coming together, and they're reflected in the, the five-year capital improvement plan through each of those units. That's okay. probably why. Okay, I just saw that, and it just caught me off guard a little bit how we were only having 400,000 out of ECHO for the parks, recreation, and culture, and we had two million, over two million funded through ECHO for the trails. And I know that uh, I just want to make sure that it's focused uh, throughout the parks and the trails. That's all with the echo money. Any echo funding that you see has to be uh, routed through our council, but before that, it has to go through our echo committee. So they would have approved that. So what you're looking at here has already been approved by those groups. Okay. That's all the questions I have. In that case, I'll make a motion. If there's nobody else has any other questions. Yeah, I have one other. What was the supplement here we received this morning? What was the difference? Oh. Um, I believe they handed you a supplement because the original document that was posted to the website yeah. uh, needed a 508 yeah, compliance for ADA. That, yeah, that it's was the explained. same exact wording. Okay. That's what I thought. I, I couldn't that, figure out the difference here. <laughs> In that case, I make a motion that we approve this, forward it to the county council. With I mean, make, make a motion to approve 
forward this to County Council with the recommendation of approval for Ordinance 2220-10. I'll second that. I think it's a clarification. Is it 60 or 10? I think the case number is 022-060. Oh, I was reading the screen. Yeah, no it's 60. I'm sorry. It is. You know, the, uh, there's, there's, so the ordinance number that's going to be officially recorded is 2022-10. Okay. For our filing purposes, it's the yeah, 2022-60, which includes things that will never come before so, you. So we but approve 60 or 10? Uh, I would recommend that you approve ordinance 2022-10. Okay, that's what I did. No, Thank still, you. Still second that. <laughs> <laughs> got it on the right for a change. Okay, we got a motion from Mr. Young, and who's the second? I'll second that. Uh, uh, Frank I'll second second second. Okay. We got a motion to forward the county council with a recommendation to approve ordinance 2022-10 from Mr. Young and a second from Mr. Costa. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Okay. Well, that looks like all of our new business for today. Uh, do we have any old business, Ms. Jackson? No, sir. Okay. And do we have any <laughs> any other public items? No, sir. Staff items. Uh, yeah, there's a couple things I want to bring up. So we are in the budget process right now for next fiscal year <coughs> I just want to bring up does this board would you want to work from iPads rather than get paper um, agendas delivered to you if so that's something that we would need to put in our budget I, we can't do it unless all of you want to do it because we'd, we'd offset the cost of those iPads by not having to print a bunch of paper and you know use the staff time for that and delivering it and so forth but we usually have this conversation about this time every year, and in the past, it's been a mixed bag, so um, I just want to bring it up again. Are you interested in going to an electronic format, or do you want to stick with the paper? Okay. Well, I'll start with Mr. Feller. Um, I'm in a computer business, so I, I, anything that we can do to save paper, I would love. I had a problem getting my packet today, but or this last week, but... I'd be for it, but you know, I, I'm not so staunch on it that I couldn't be swayed to keep doing paper, but I would absolutely be for it. Mr. Young? I have no real opinion one way or another. I enjoy the paper because I tend to keep copies of all my agendas and so forth, so I'm a little prejudiced towards paper, but mm -hmm. I, I could live with the computer if it's everybody else. Ms. Shelley? I I'm old school. I particularly love paper with reports because of the way I read them, comment on them, make my marks and all that stuff. It's just yeah. easier for me with paper. But that's my two cents. Mr. Bender. Paper. <laughs> Mr. Koppel. Yeah, uh, papers. I like to take notes on them, mm -hmm. highlight things as I go. Mr. Sixma. I'll go with the majority, but I'm old fashioned. I like paper. I like making notes and all that. So. <laughs> Okay, we, get, we got it. Paper, we'll right? stick with the paper. <laughs> yeah, we're no problem. With paper. paper or rock, you know which one it is. <laughs> and the the other item I just wanted to uh, kind of give you a heads up. We, as you've noticed, probably the change in our format for variance requests. We're going to try to revise that a bit more. Number one, we have to put in a blurb about the property rights element. That is now effective. So we're going to just be putting a blurb in there that. You must consider the property rights element and the tenants that are included in that element. Um, the other thing we're going to do is we are only going to be addressing the variances that are requested. A lot of times what's coming before the board and it's taking up a lot of staff time is we roll in all these other structures that are on the property to legitimize them. But then at the same time we put this uh, condition in there that says if they're damaged in excess of 75 percent they have to meet code well that's our normal code anyway mm -hmm. so we're not really giving them anything so we're not going to include them we're only going to include the the structures for which the variance is needed or requested and we may if the house is not in the right spot we'll probably 
roll that in and legitimize where it's located um, so that if that were to burn down or whatever, they could rebuild where it is. Um, but this, that should shorten our staff reports, and we're trying to shorten our presentations and shorten the, the actual report format to make us a bit more efficient. And at the same time, we're hoping to adopt, a, we're working right now on drafting an administrative variant. So some of these don't need to come before you, like the variance to separate non-conforming lots when it's obvious that it, you're going to approve it. You know, it's something that we can't combine or, it, you know, it's just like 10 property owners ago, they were owned um, in conjunction with adjacent property, stuff like that. Things that are um, very minor, we could find a way to grant administratively. We hope, we're drafting that now and hope to get it to you within the next couple months. So just giving you a heads up, if you, if you, you know, see these changes in our staff reports, that's what we're trying to do. We, we, we're just getting inundated with variance requests. It's taking up a lot of our time that we would like to be able to spend on true planning um, rather than legitimizing all these things. Also, I'd like to, I've been thinking about this a lot on the properties that have the two front yards because of corner lots. And, and I understand your comments on it, why that is in place. But could we just consider that the side yard, whatever the side of the house is, the front yard being 25 foot or whatever the setback is to the front yard, to the front being considered that much of the side yard? And the red, I mean, be a front yard and the rest side yard? On so we allow that in the R9 where we have a 25 foot front and then this what they call the street side front uh -huh. that is reduced to 15. Would you like to see something like that for all the zoning classifications? I don't think that I don't I don't think that reducing it to a true side yard is is really going to work primarily because these are corner lots, and there is a, a sight line triangle at the at a corner intersection of a road. And if you're putting the houses too close up to the road, that can affect that sight line triangle and diminish the visibility for safe transportation at an intersection. That's why I'm saying within whatever the front yard setback is, make the side that other front yard that's really not the same setback to the front and then continue on as if it was a side yard. Does that make sense? I'm not. Um, I, I, I believe he's, he's, he had, uh, the, the chair is asking for some reduction in the second front yard, similar to what we do in R9, where yeah. you yeah. technically two front yards, but the second front yard, which is usually the longer one, or it, you know, if you're planning your house correctly, it should be the longer one, um, has a uh, essentially reduced front yard, but obviously for sight distance and safety reasons, um, you know, if it's an open right of way, um, you need to have some clear zone and some distance from the actual traveled way to the, the structure. But we can look at all those residential zoning standards and see, um, you know, an appropriate reduction to the second front yard instead of having them, you know, it, Hopefully, it'll it'll eliminate a lot of these uh, variances on um, second front yards. Not all of them. Some of these lots are very extreme and very small. But um, I think if you are creating a new corner lot today, your width needs to be 15% more than the uh, required normal frontage. So that's that's a standard we have. So we can we can kind of look at that. There's the corner lots are supposed to be bigger. But these old plats didn't didn't make them bigger. They're the same size as every single lot, and so they're they're subject to two front yards, and it shrinks the billable area. Um, we can look at that, you know, applying a reduced second front yard to these um, other zoning districts. Because I don't know if we've ever turned down a variance for a second front yard. To be honest with you, I, I think you might be right. Yeah. We can look but at all the zoning classifications and come up with some reasonable proposal and bring it forward to you for a discussion. And then, if 
I mean, it'd make your job easier. Right. Yeah. <laughs> no, they'll just ask for variances to that. <laughs> exactly, Chair. <laughs> that would be good. I'd be Chair, can that. I say one thing about that? I would just be cautioning that obviously the side yard on those corner lots still maintain the fact that, you know, the the height of the fence is a big issue for some of those corners. So keep in fact, whatever we change it to, we want to make sure that if there's a fence going up there, it doesn't automatically just default to four feet. I mean, to, you know, uh, to six feet when it might have some sight line issues. So I would just take that into consideration, but I fully agree. <laughs> a lot of times it's why, why this. You know, I, I would think fun. each lot individual time that comes up is gonna be a different situation, depends on what street it is, if it's intersection. So. Well, that's true, but the, we've already got a front yard set back. I mean, yeah. we've got the house sitting there. Yeah, I, I, mean, I totally agree with you, it's crazy, so. So, but anyway. Huh. Okay, any other staff items? Comments? No, sir. Well, staff comments, yes. So we do have the water quality workshop scheduled and we included the press release in your packet. However, I have just found out as of yesterday, it's not going to be in the training rooms downstairs. It's gonna be up here in this room. Mm. And there's also a virtual option, it, you know, in the event that it's jam packed in here, or you wanna watch it from home, it, there will be a virtual option. I don't know what the link is at this point. I'd, I recommend staying up on what's on the website because that's where the link will be. But it will be in here. It will be in here, and that's on February 22nd at 9.30 to 2.30. Okay. And then I also found out that we will be having a growth management workshop. I believe that's April 22nd? Uh, April 12th, April, I believe. April 12th, okay. Yes. And I don't have very much information on that, except for I think it's going to be in this room as well. Um, and maybe, Paula, do you have any info? Um, I think it's it's going to be discuss a lot of growth issues. So um, permitting, um, you know, development standards. Some of the, there's going to be some overlap between the water quality workshop and growth management in terms of, I believe, low impact development principles. All of this will eventually come before this commission to discuss, you know, in terms of changes to the ordinance, changes to the comprehensive plan. Um, this is something that uh, I encourage you to attend and to watch and see what the discussions are. Um, and we'll, we'll, once we get those uh, workshops settled and links to it, we'll send it out to uh, the, the commission. You'll give us more if, uh, information on that coming out of the next meeting and tomorrow till now. Yeah, we should be able to by then. Okay. Okay. Any commission comment? Yeah, I, I, just, I know Frank's got to go, but one thing I'd like to say real quick, the very first case, I wish we knew, no, we didn't know anything about the uh, the boat hoist until I actually heard it from the lady on the, yeah, I know. the, the neighbor next door, and that could have swayed my vote one way, 180, all the way, just by hearing that, so if I hadn't heard that, I might have voted one way, you know, so I, if there, that information is out there, I'd like to sort of know that, if possible. So. Well, I don't know if uh, legal, can we require that? I don't think we can require, require this if it's something that we don't. Uh, well, it's, it's part of the submitted site plan. of, And then you can take into account when the variance comes is, you know, how far is the dock away from the extension of the property line? How much room does that give for someone to maneuver a boat or park a boat or dock a boat or put in a boat lift? That is something you can take into account. So, you know, for the submitted uh, site plans for the proposed dock, you know, you can ask, okay, where's your boat? Where are you, where are you going to park your boat? Um, are you installing a dock? Um, does the, or a lift? And does the combination of the boat dock, uh, the, the dock and the lift and the boat result in an interference with your adjacent neighbor's riparian rights? Um, because we do have that 15 foot uh, separation from the extension of the property lines for a reason is to prevent interference and they are requesting to come in to that uh, that setback and that's you know it, it's everyone has the right to dock out but they also must respect the other person's right to dock out free from interferences so you can take that into account I don't know if you can um, as part of our request when these docks come into place we should be asking um, 
are there any boat lifts involved? You know, is, are there other things that are going to um, that we need to that the commission needs to take into consideration when they're determining whether it's a reasonable request? I, w I would like that if possible. You know, just in prior docs, I think we've had the layout on. You know, most of the time they've got okay, our boat's going here. Holy, here's the posts. You know, so I'm sort of used to seeing that. So if possible, it'd be good. Understood. If I could just jump in, I forgot to mention that we have a new staff member. I'd like to introduce Alicia Brantley. She's she's going to be a staff assistant, so she'll be very f becoming very familiar with all this equipment and with this board. And she will be your liaison. Welcome, Alicia. <laughs> <laughs> Any other commission comments, Mr. Feller? I have two. One first. Mr. Hansen, your, your um, work that you've done coming through is really, so, I mean, gone out over the top. It's great. You've answered most of my questions every time I hear it. So I just want to congratulate you on really putting together great, great things for us. And then the other thing I wanted to say is I just wanted to thank the, my, my fellow members and, and uh, Paolo, the staff attorney, for uh, what was probably a little bit of a, of a strange morning. But I just want to thank you all for your support. And, and because this is an ongoing case, my recommendation is, you know, keep the ex parte communications to a minimum in terms of the applicant and the, uh, the adjacent property owners. You know, case isn't over. You continued it. It's still ongoing. Um, you want to divest yourself free from any, you know, potential, um, I guess, uh, what's the presumption of prejudice? Because that's the whole point of the disclosure is that someone you know, knows that outside communications have taken place. So for this particular application, I, I would advise you keep that to a minimum. Thank you. And on that same subject, I don't want to expand on that, and I don't want to, I don't want explanations coming in or whatever. I'm not saying this occurred, but a mention was made of Facebook. And I would say it behooved, not that anyone on this board did anything on Facebook, but I think it would behoove us, and my question is to you, that that could again, that could be a public record. Uh, if you get in, if you make a comment on a Facebook yes, post yes, so, that tends so to be, that might be on our agenda. Right. Right. So I would highly recommend that sure. if we come across those, that we as board sure. members do not make a comment. We um, can read those comments, but should not you participate. You know what, we've had, we do have a social media policy. Um, uh, I'll see if I can dig that up and send it it's to. It's important since someone so brought it up in kind yeah. of an accusatory right. manner that we need to just be aware of that. And from our perspective, to protect the integrity of our board. Right. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, we, were we done with commission comments? All right. Any press and citizen comments? Hearing none, this meeting is adjourned.